All right, people, you guys know what it is. It's the one and the only American Cholo podcast broadcasting live and direct to you from North Hollywood, California. My name is Gil, and I am the American Cholo. And of course, I got the co-host in the building. That's right, that's right. I'm back, and we got a good one for today. We, we, oh, I, think, I think we always have one, but this, yeah, yeah, but this, 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 this is a real good one. This, this, this is a great one right yeah, here, man. Yeah. Let, let, let's go down memory lane. Let's yeah, talk some real lane. stuff. Let's let me let me introduce this gentleman here, and he is a gentleman, get by on, the way. Get on it. Our next guest is a man who was raised in the South during segregation and knows knows too well how bad it really was. He's a Vietnam vet. He's a postman for one of Detroit's most dangerous areas. He is also the father of one of the world's most famous rappers, Snoop Dogg. Please give a warm welcome to the one and only Papa Snoop. That's yeah, right. that's right. What's up? Yeah. What's, what's, what's good, Papa Snoop? I'm yeah, good, man. Yeah, that's I'm right. good. That's right. Uh, thank you for coming over here. Thanks We're for having me. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate, we the, appreciate love, the love, man. So let's just jump right into it, man. Where were you born and raised? I was born in a small town, Magnolia, Mississippi, uh, four miles from Macomb, 45 minutes from New Orleans. It's at the very bottom of Mississippi, 1949. So is that how close Mississippi is to New Orleans? Yeah, 45 minutes. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah, I didn't know. Know. I'm, I'm, but I'm at the very bottom, like eight miles there's Louisiana right there. Another, another 45 minutes you in New Orleans. Really? Yeah. So now, you know, this was a whole different era. You know, you were born in what year again? 1949. 1949. So when you were like, a, well, let me ask you this. When did you first start seeing as a young African-American boy that life was different for you than everybody else or the white people in, in, in well, Mississippi? I, I started seeing it because my dad had a landscaping business. And I, I really came from money. All my dad's uh, brothers and sisters had their own business. Mm-hmm. So my dad had a landscaping business. His sister and her husband, they had a big dairy. My auntie had a store. My other aunties were piano teachers and choir directors and voice coaches. So my, by me, my dad had a landscaping business. We worked for all the rich white people, ex-slave owners, daughters, and sons, right? Mm-hmm. They, had wow. these, they had these big literally, huge, literally they had these big wow. huge houses, houses. My dad took me my first landscape job when I was six years old. Cause back then, people started, started working they started, you started working early as a kid. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the 50s, okay? So that being said, I started seeing the difference between how white people live and how, how we live in, in my neighborhood. Yes. I, mean, I came from a decent house, but back then, most blacks was poor. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have city water. Everybody either had a, a well or either a pump, okay? We had a pump. We'd go out there, you start it up, had the wow. engine on it. And once the pressure got up, then you pump it like this. There were no bathrooms back then. We all had out, outhouses. You took a bath in a number three tent tub, okay? Damn. And so I came from a family of 12, six boys and six girls. But back then, there wasn't no natural gas. was no TV. TV came out in 1948, a year before I was born. We got our first TV in 1957, but we didn't have time to watch because my dad was a workaholic, okay? So my mom was a housewife. So back then, uh, I was fortunate because my dad had a landscaping business. I worked a whole week with my dad son up some down. I only got 25 bucks. And I knew not to ask my dad for no more money because the first thing he, he was going to tell me, you're up under my roof, I'm feeding you, take what I give you. Sir. But back then everything was cheap. You know, a, a, a pack of cigarettes cost twenty five dollars. I mean twenty five cents. Oh, twenty five cents. Yeah. Gas like seventeen cents a gallon. Wow. Uh, a hamburger twenty five cents. So my dad told me how to handle the money. Okay, you just take five dollars for yourself, divide the other twenty up, and save it, put it in a shoebox or a cookie jar or whatever. So back then it was all they had bathrooms that had white and color. Mm-hmm. Uh, a water fountains were white and color. Back then you couldn't look at a white woman if she was black. Prime example, Emmett Till. Came down from Chicago, 1955. I was six years old. Back then, everybody had radios. So you got the ba- basketball game on radio, baseball game, football game. I think Jackie Robinson had came along. Will Chamberlain, I mean, uh, uh, Bill Russell came along in 1957. Will Chamberlain came along in 1959. They kind of bro- broke the color, color barrier. Mm-hmm. But they were still being called niggas and stuff, even if they, if they was good. Give an example, uh, Bill, Bill, I mean, uh, Bill Russell stayed in Cape Cod. And he won the first. He won eight championships in a row. And, and the white, the white, right? For people right, that know who Bill Russell is. right. They didn't start winning until Red Orbeck drafted them. Red Orbeck didn't see no color. Okay, uh, Vince Lombardi didn't see no color. I knew Al Davis personally. He started going down south drafting black players from the swag, Groundland, Jackson State, and everything. And he was all about winning. So back then, like I said, you couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't stay in the hotel. Okay, and at the end of the day, man, if you went to a, a, a hamburger stand, you ordered at the front, but you gave your food at the back door. Wow. That's how it was back then. And at the time, did you think it was just normal? Did you ever question it? Ask your daddy, like, hey, daddy, why do we have to yeah, go here? Yeah, I questioned it. I'm going to tell you why. I, I, I was hearing my daddy say, yeah, I said, no, sir. 
that was mandatory down south if you was black. You got to say yes to it, no, no such to the white man. And I wonder why, do we have to see it? Well, all, all the white kids, Don't the white to. people that my dad worked for, their kids would call my dad William. But we had to call their they, they, they moms and dad Mr. and Mrs. So I, I couldn't comprehend that. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out why, I mean, what's the difference between them and us? So that, that really, really resonated on me that why, the, why are they better than us and they making money off us because back then in Mississippi it was all cotton. White people made their money on cotton. They had plantations. Back then they had sharecroppers. Matter of fact, give you an example. I went to my first class reunion in 1988. A bunch of my classmates, I never knew where they lived at. They lived in the country. I lived in town, right? So one of my classmates said to me, she said, she's, she's, Vernon, was, was you are rich. That's why, that's why, that's not one rich. That's, I, I, my, my dad, we had a, had a, had a landscape business. They said, well, you go to Sousa school every day, we went around. And I told them, I swear, here's the deal. All the white people work for, they had kids our age, right? They go down to New Orleans. They had a store called Godshaw on Canal Street. Buy the kids a suit. The kids to my size. So they, they wear it one time to give it to us. So we was always clean. Okay, so I didn't realize they were sharecroppers. If you know what if you don't know what sharecropping is, you stand on the white man's land when they said when they said 40 acres on the mule, they meant that. The white man had for you give you 40 acres on the mule. You 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 you, you planted his food. He got most of the money. He gave you the crumbs. So they made that money off cotton. Okay. And back then, man, it wasn't nothing for them to kill a black guy like it was nothing. They used to have night riders to ride through my neighborhood. Night riders were just like this. Back in the day, all the smart black people kept the kids on, on, on the back porch when they got dark, right? So white, you have uh, white boys in the truck, three in the front, four in the back, with baseball bats, chains, and guns. They had a chase car behind them with six white boys in it. They would ride down through these country roads, and the first black they seen, if you didn't haul all ass, you was gone. Mm-hmm. So, you know about Emmett Till, Mega Everest, all the guys got killed. Back then, it was way more than that. But it wasn't publicized. Right. So, that's the kind of shit we had to go through, man. Damn. And did, uh, were your grandparents alive at this time? Yeah, but uh, I didn't know my, 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 my dad's mother and father did pass on. My, mom, my mom's people, my grandfather, he, he died when I was eight. And my grandmother died, his wife died when I was 20. But they came in and came in on, on the tail end of slavery. Back then, people told stories. You know, you go to somebody's house, all, all these old people, and the first thing they would tell us is two people you got to, you, you got to be uh, beware of, the white man and the Jews. Don't trust them, period. They preached that to us, man, right? From so the jump. From the jump. Come to find out my, my mom's mom, her first husband, a bunch of a lot of black guys back then, they, they were really losing their lives in the bow down to the white man. Her husband got hung because he was one of the one black guys that was rebellious. So she got married to my other grandfather. And the stories they would tell us, man, about the KKK, how all that got stuff got started. What happened was a bunch of white boys said, okay, let's get these niggas. Let's get some white sheets in the hood, cut the eyes out of the nose, and go through their neighborhoods. And come to find out, most of them was doctors, lawyers, and judges. Wow. But you couldn't see their face. You feel what I'm saying? Educated people. Yes, right. So, but I come to find out, I began to distinguish the difference between the rich white people and the, and the poor white man. The rich white people... If they seen you was black and you was trying to be somebody, like my dad, I had gravy. They they loved my dad, okay? But the, but the poor white people, the white the rich white people would pay them to blow up our churches. Every church in my neighborhood was blown up, period. Give an example, 1963, we had just came back from church because that's all we had in my hometown, going to church, playing baseball. They had juke joints back then, but I was too young to go to them. So what happened was, man, is that back then, man, we, we didn't have no TVs. We didn't have the, the luxury these kids got nowadays. No air conditioning. We, no, I grew up with fans. The first, I never forget the first television we got. It was it wasn't that big, right? It was that you had to put the antenna on the outside, right? Say for instance, you and you and me watching TV. I was sitting you outside, you outside. I took the TV and you started turning the antenna. Hey man, go back to the right. Okay, go back to the left. Once you got it right, you still had to, had to stick your face right in front of that TV. It was so damn fuzzy, you couldn't see shit. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But that's how it was back then, man. A lot of people couldn't afford the TV. They had radios, man. Now, how was uh, how was you and your siblings? Do you all, I mean, those were obviously some of the you know worst times in American history prior right. to slavery. Right. But did you have good times with your parents, with your ki- with your oh, brothers yeah. and sisters, your siblings? Oh, yeah. But, yeah but here's the deal. We, we made the best out of a bad situation. I had to go to church. I had to go to Bible study. I had to go to prayer meeting. I had to go to conference. Church, it was mandatory that you wore a suit. 
I look at kids nowadays, they don't wear suits to church. Back then, no. man, if you had one suit, you would have that one suit to church every time you went to church. Okay. It was, it was very important. Very, very important. But back then, people taught the kids values. Back then, people, Seth Vincent, everybody who had a child, my dad and mom molded, they, they, back then, people molded and shaped their kids. Right. To, to where, once you finish high school, leave home. My family migrated to California. Most people in my neighborhood went to Chicago, but they had better jobs. They had, uh, they had, uh, they had, uh, they had uh, uh, the meat packing plant in Chicago, Oscar Myers, Cam Soup in, in Chicago. They had the steel mills in Gary Nana. Back then, they were making cars out of steel, okay, versus the way they make cars now. So everybody would go to Chicago. They all, <laughs> I never get what my dad told me. They would always come back in, back home in a brand new car. My dad never had a, had a house, though, because my uncle, he built a house, he built a house. My dad ne- never had a car, though. At, at 9 o'clock at night, the lights went out. What, like I said, what, we had a TV, but we couldn't watch it. Mm-hmm. So that being said, when they would come home in these big cars, the first time my dad would tell me, he said, "Well, when they get back to Chicago, they're gonna be afraid to go to the mailbox." I was dead away. He's called. They're gonna have a stack of bills. He said, "I ain't got no bills." And I, I didn't see it then. I was a kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm looking at the cars, man. I'm, back then, they had big cars, Cadillacs and, and Oldsmobiles and '98. They was long. They was man. <laughs> if I was, cars. yeah, they had real cars. But they had, cars. they not they weren't cars. They were automobiles. Yes, right. Okay, ah. they was fast back then. Big engines and stuff. Yep. So my dad would always tell me, don't look at what, what a person's driving. He said, I know, he said, I know when they get back to Chicago, they ain't got no damn money. It was the people who stayed down south who had the money. Cause they didn't spend nothing. Think about it, no car, no. Back then, yep. I, my dad didn't, they didn't know what a, a mortgage was. Wasn't no credit check back then. It was about having a name. Okay, my dad's name, William Bernardo. Oh, that's William's kid. Give me the thing you want. But if he had a bad name, they wouldn't give you shit. Okay, this is how it went. It was it was on like almost like on street code and name. Yeah. If you if your if your name's no good, we ain't giving you nothing. We ain't giving you shit. Right. Just that simple, man. So let's let's push forward a little bit. Let's go into your into your high school years. What are you doing in high school? Are you going to school? Are you getting educated? Or are you no, it was, working it, with your dad? It was military, it was military went to school. I left uh, Mississippi in nineteen sixty six, moved to San Francisco, did my last year of high school at, uh, in Frisco. Graduated. Why did you guys? Why did you end up going to San Francisco? Because my my, my dad's sister lived out there. Okay. And and uh my my dad's people moved to the West Coast. They was in Frisco, Sacramento, and Oroville. My my old brothers and sisters they moved. <coughs> they moved to Long Beach. All right. So when I finished high school, I turned eighteen years old. Back then, they would send you a draft court. Okay. But we sent you a draft court. Okay, you was eligible for the draft. Mm-hmm. Then they would write you a letter and tell you because during that time the Vietnam War was red hot. Yes. Okay, this just this this is just before I got drafted in January six to eight. This is just before the Tet offenses, right? Get my draft card, go down to the, to the draft office. I was it was one A, four F and one Y. If it was one A, you was gone. That means you was in good health. Four F and one four F and one Y, you had you had a medical condition, a football injury, you weren't going nowhere. Mm-hmm. I was one A, so I got I get drafted. I go to Fort Lewis Washington. I'm eighteen years old. Go through basic. Finish uh, Fort Lewis. I go to El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss. That's why I trained for Vietnam. Yet. And the bad part about that, I trained for Vietnam in White Sands, New Mexico. If you know anything about, about White Sands, New Mexico. Yeah. That's what I did in the damn deserts, man. We shooting at guns I was on. They called it a duster. It was, it was a Navy gun. They took the deterrent off the Navy ship and put it on a half track. So you could do a 360. You could shoot up, but you could shoot down. It had, had a six-man team, a driver, squad leader, two cannoneers, one, and a gunner, and a, and a guy who turned the tub. So I, I trained on that. So after after I, uh, AIT, they started calling your name out, where you was going. Okay, everybody, Vietnam, 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 Vietnam. I go on for 30 days, right? I leave for G- Vietnam uh, June 3rd, leave from Travis Air Force Base, Fairfield, stop in Hawaii. Stopped in Wake Island, stopped in Guam. The last stop was the Philippines. Matter of fact, I bumped into James Brown in the Philippines. Called, <laughs> no, on the real, he was, he was on, the way, on his way to Vietnam because a lot, a lot of people were going to Vietnam because they was curious about Vietnam. Right. Leave there, we get to, we left there. We, I landed in Vietnam June 4th. I never forget, about 6.30 in the morning. They're on them, they're on them, they're on okay, them. Okay, <laughs> okay. About, we get to about 6.30 in the morning. You on a cool ass airplane. I'm from the south and I'm used to heat, right? When they opened that door up, it was about four and twenty-five guys on, on, the, on the plane because they had chartered planes back then. Mm-hmm. 
I went over, over there on, on Saturday night line. When I got up there, they opened that door, and we started walking out. I had never felt heat like that in my life. It was like, like walking into a thousand degree furnace. Then the next thing I noticed is the smell. It smelled like, smell like, smell like death. I heard all kinds of noise, shooting helicopters, jets. You know, I see all these Vietnam, Vietnamese people squatting down with their black hats on, straw hats on, black pajamas. Their teeth was all black. They was chewing some kind of tobacco. We well, unloading the plane. That heat was kicking my ass. So I ain't gonna lie. It, to it, you. It, you weren't used to that from the Mississippi heat. I don't, that, no, this heat you wouldn't believe. It. It, 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 this one heat. This was like walking to a furnace, like a thousand degrees. So we, we unloading the, the plane was unloading, and all of a sudden we started hearing these loud rounds falling behind the plane. All we had was our paperwork. We didn't have a gun, <laughs> so we trying to figure out what's that. But right, it was in close and closer to the plane. Right, they pulled the steps back, rolled the steps back, closed the door, and the plane started taking off. Sergeant say, man, run into the bunker. We didn't know what the bunker was. In Vietnam, they call you FNGs, fucking new guys. Yeah. Because you just got there. <laughs> no, no, you just got there. You don't know shit, right? So you're not even off the plane or helicopter yet. No, no. Uh, we, no, we off. I'm off. Mm -hmm. Some of my boys off, but the plane's still unloading. So when they close the door, the guys left on the plane. So the plane's trying to get away from the mortar rounds. You run into, inside the bunker, okay? Bam. You run inside the bunker. After they stopped firing, right? So they took us to, to these barracks. We was at, at uh, Ben Air Force Base. They took us to Long Ben, to the nine of the place. That's all the Vietnam vets went, right? So they got a barracks. So the first thing me and my homeboy said, hey, man, the guys who was coming back home, if we want some weed, who do we go to? They said, go to Mommy's son. Okay, Mommy's son was a Mama pimp. Son. Yeah. <laughs> like platoon. Right, right. right. Mommy's Mama son was a pimp. She was a dope dealer. Papa's son kept everything clean, but Mommy's son ran shit, the whole house and everything. So we go to Mama's son. They said, don't ask for no weed. Ask for happy smoke. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and we laughed at it, but when we smoked it, it, was, it made you happy. Yeah. <laughs> it made you real happy, right? So we bought a whole sandbag of uh, weed, me and two of my boys, for $15 in their money. They money called piastres. You know, when, once you get to, to age, they money look different. Than ours. Mm -hmm. It's colorful, right? Bought the weed. So we sit in, sit in the barracks waiting to see what was next. So I just come in. He said, I, I need a 25-man detail. They didn't matter volunteer, right? So he saw it picking, picking out guys. He got me, my boys, woo, wham, wham. So we go, get on the back, he's deucing the ass. About two, about two truckloads for and they had, they had these quarter ton trucks with trell with, with trellis behind them. And I seen the medevac ambulances and stuff, and they gave us a bucket. We didn't know where we was going. So we ride up, we ride out this helicopter pad. This thing that really messed me up. I'd, be, I'd been in Vietnam less than three hours. We go out to this helicopter pad, and we stood there waiting. He, he said, fill you, fill you buckets up for the water. Here come a line of helicopters flying in. We, we just got there. Yeah. We FNGs, right? <laughs> and when the helicopters saw landing, guess it was dead bodies. Five. I mean, it was, it was like about six helicopters, six helicopters, whole 18 people, right? Mm -hmm. Some was in body bags, some was all messed up. And man, it was like, I'm saying to myself, we just, am I seeing this shit already? Jeez. So we once you get unloaded the bodies, the ones that was dead, we put them. On the flatbed trail, on the flatbed trucks, the one that had a chance to make it, they called it the Golden Hour. They put them in the ambulance and took them to the hospital and started working on them. So after they unloaded the helicopters, we take our buckets of water and threw them on the floor to wipe the blood out. They take back off. We take, they take off again. So we actually saw it. Where are they going? Guess what he told us? They going to get more. And, and you're five in five hours into landing. Less than less than three and a half hours. Damn. So they're going to get more. Mm -hmm. We just got there. That, that heat, man, we sucking with that heat was kicking our ass. I ain't gonna lie to you. Here they, then they come back again for the, with the last load. We said, Shoo. so what happened was the guys that was going back home. I never forget this one white guy was telling us today, man, the training you had in the United States, forget about that. He said they gonna train you. We said who? He said like, this is a little guy named Charlie Kong. We didn't know who the hell he was. Yeah. So. We kind of chuck it off and shit. So we stayed there for two days, and they start the next, the third day. They start calling out people. You going to the first cab? You going to the twenty fifth? You going to the hundred first airborne division? You going? They just talking, they t telling you where you going. So I went. I was going to the first cab. We was down south. Some of the guys I trained with, they they stayed down south. So I went up north to not train. So what happened was we got we went to not train first, and McFadden, his son grandson, played football for the Oakland Raiders. Number 20, the running back. Yes. That was a great grandson. So McFadden got, in, got into it with his white boy. He had been wounded in Vietnam. He had a cast down. They gives him a fight, and the white boy knocks him out with, with his cast. Mm -hmm. He was a Vietnam vet, and he had the thousand, in Vietnam, they called it a thousand yard stare. Because you don't see some of his shit that you looking like this all the time. 
So that but Mac Fadden found a brick somewhere and waited waited till he went to sleep and, and, and broke his goddamn jaw. So we got through that shit. Then we go to Queen Yon. That's when I seen my first NVA soldiers. We get to Queen Yon, that was my last stop before I got to my unit. You seen all these little kids out there. They was all had them shackled together with chains and shit. Some had their legs blowed off, some had their arms blowed off. So we asked Sarge, who is that? He said, that's who you're going to be fighting. I said, they look like kids. He said, well, when you beat them motherfuckers, <laughs> you're going to find out real quick. They could, they they a fighting machine. So we get to, get to our, our, our unit. We watched the movie Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. Cool Hand Luke. And they took us to the firing range next day. We fired. Then they sent us out to our unit. And I had a racist ass uh, a sergeant named Sergeant Dearborn. I'll never forget him. Maybe, maybe bust in there. He, he didn't like blacks, right? Because Vietnam was a racial war. Think about it. Six to eight. They, had, they was protesting, burning flags, burning draft cards and shit. Now we over with these white boys. It wasn't the white boys from, that was from back east. It was the ones that from down south that was just treating black tenant kind of way. Mm-hmm. Just what happened, most guys, my unit, they was from New York, Chicago, Detroit. They didn't play that shit. Yeah. I was fresh in California less than two years. And I'm, I came from this small ass town, all naive and shit. They told me, hey, homeboy, we from, we from the city. You get with us. We got you. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I, I, I fired a couple rounds that night, and Southern Dearborn came out and jumped in my ass. The next day, I, a Jeep pulled up, say, Fernando, excuse me, pack, pack, your, uh, pack your duffel bag. We shipping y'all. I shorted out with the South Koreans. It wasn't shit happening with them. So they sent me to a place called LZ Action, and my whole life changed after that. Every morning about 536, between 536 in the morning, they're dropping mortar rounds. I had never been shot at before. And the mortar rounds, man, it will wake a dead man up. Mm-hmm. They walk him in, crack out, crack out. They throw lead everywhere, right? So the one, this, in Vietnam, every Vietnam they would tell you, there's one incident they would never forget. August 24th, 1968, this bridge got, got overran. Bridge 26. On, on Highway 19, me and this guy, white guy named Ron, we still in, we still in touch. We pulling guard dude one night. We sitting like this. The bridge was a half mile away, right? So the lieutenant calls in. He said, man, I've been in Vietnam about a week before three months. He said, we got buku movement. That means buku in Vietnamese mean the whole lot. Permission to fire. Go back in Vietnam, you can put the hand right in front of your face and you couldn't see nothing. He, we had a, a scope called Starlight Star by Infrared. He said, we got Buku movement. I knew what that meant. He said, permission to fire. Captain Reed told him, uh, permission to die. We don't want you shooting up, shooting up the pipeline. They were shooting up the pipeline, the pipeline every night. But bridges in Vietnam was crucial. God, they blew them up. You couldn't, you couldn't bring supplies through. The time you hung the radio up, the firefight started. It wasn't a firefight. It was a massacre. Mm-hmm. The AK-47 has yellow and green traces. Every fifth round was tracing. I, the M16 got red traces. Every fifth round was tracing. All we seen was yellow and green. RPGs. And the losing, he called back again. He said, we can't hold them off. They're all of us. It was two of our guys. And what they do, what they did, they watched them, right? Okay, it's 12 of y'all, right? I'm breaking in 25 or 30 to make sure I get your ass. And that night, he was hungry. So the last thing he said, they're all of us. We can hold them off. And the, the radio went dead. And then the Vietnamese got on the radio. And we knew right then they was all gone. So Lieutenant comes out. He said, man, pack your shit. Get all the ammunition you can. Bridge 26 got overrun. Like, we just seen it get overrun. You shut up. We just saw it. Everybody, the whole fire base is up looking at it. What shit we can do? Half a mile away. Jump on our track. I tell, I tell uh, my lieutenant, I said, that's the that's LT. I don't mean to be intervening. I said, don't, don't you think it would be a good idea, idea for us once you leave this gate to us shooting on both sides? The bridge just got overrun. So we, if in case we get returned fire, because they know we're coming, and he probably got an ambush set up for us. So we rode down a half mile, shooting on both sides. There's one white boy, he lived. i never forget, he was, he was, we had a black light, a black infrared light on. It's like about 2 o'clock in the morning. But he running towards us, and we seen us, he passed out, he popped red in the middle of the highway. That's how scared he was. We get down to the bridge. 11 guys had their hands tied behind their back with a combo wire. They had cut all everybody's throat. Shot them in the head, took all their wallets, watches. They took all their weapons, but the, the M60, they left the M60. That's, that's one that will puzzle me for the rest of my life. That's a machine gun. Mm-hmm. So, and they, they, they got this big leaflet with a nail and nail in your chest. G-I-D-D. Let me get the fuck out of Vietnam. Shit. Yeah, we sit on the bridge, the earth, and we didn't know that it was 12-14s coming to drop a bomb. We sit on the bridge, the bridge wasn't that big. 
And they came and dropped two 500 pound bombs. And when they exploded, my ears started bleeding. It's like they was, wow. they, they, they was that close. Mm -hmm. that was, that was the, that's the instant, instant I'll never forget. And how old were you at this time? 18 and a half. 18 years old. Had nev oh. Yeah, eight, never been shot at. I've been shot at with a BB gun, but not the shit they were shooting at me. Yeah, but well, they were dropping <laughs> bombs on your guys. Yeah. Yeah. Man, dropping bombs. Are no mission to RPGs, man. Now, four days later, I get wounded. Four days later, Highway 19, they had two fire bases there. at LV Shiloh, Pump Station 7, Bridge 26th. Where I was, there's the action. They had pump station eight. We had two convoys come through every day by fifty trucks, bringing supplies for either from NK to Play Cool, or either from Play Cool to NK. So that being said, they came through one Saturday morning. We was getting hit every every weekend. August twenty eight, they come through. It was about ten twenty five. So me and my boy, we out there just but I did just fucking around, just shooting the shit, and they started hitting the, uh, the convoy. They started hitting the pump station. And we think, okay, they, 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 they're not going to hit us. All of a sudden, they start hitting us. So me and Ron jump on the track. And this shit happened so damn fast during the firefight, man. People don't realize that shit happened like this, bam, like a, a, a millisecond. They dropped around. My lieutenant got hit. I got hit. Ron got hit. I squalded the car. He lost one of his eyes. Ron, this white guy that I'm still in touch with, he jumped off the track. He drove the car beneath the track. I tried to drag Lieutenant Helmet, but I, I weighed 145. He, he was about 6'4", we were about 240. I couldn't move him. So what shit I can do? But they had stopped firing by then. Mm -hmm. Went to the hospital. Two days later, they sent me back. I didn't want to go back up to me. I was scared to say I ain't going to lie to you. And what they do, they put fear in you. So once they, once they put fear in you, they got you. Yeah. I was on the fire base with about 120 guys. Everybody was scared. Because we knew on any given day or any given night, we can get overrun, everybody gone. Is that being I was? Damn. Did you did you end up having either or like a hate for the Viet Cong with the Vietnamese people, and also did you have respect for them after the war? Or now that you can talk about it, I have respect for them for number one. I've always wondered why 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 was we there? My thing, why uh, I had hate for the white guys that you fighting with every damn day. They playing Tim Tim and one that. Johnny Cash, Hank Williams, we playing Motown, Temptation, Four Top. You know, we playing soul music. They, they, they holler, hey, man, turn that, that nigga music off. And the fight was on. You feel me? Yeah. Now, to make it even worse, you go out there on patrol with these folks. You, you might lose a few guys, a few guys because you wounded. But you come back to your fire base, all the white boys telling all to themselves, they want to fuck with you. All the black guys from Latinos and Puerto Ricans, we telling to ourselves. And let me say this, man. And this is the respect for Latinos, blacks, and Puerto Ricans. We was the one putting down. We was the one kicking ass. Yeah. We didn't get that respect. Your people, my people, and the Puerto Ricans, we was the bad motherfuckers in, the, in Vietnam. Just that damn simple. We, we, never, got the, we never got the props. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what, what was a, a good moment in Vietnam for you? You smoking Cambodian red, the best <laughs> weed in the world. <laughs> that was the best moment for that me. That was the best moment? Who, who right. Got, who got to that? Mama son? Mama son. Mama son. <laughs> And here's the Mama's deal. Mama's not get you everything, huh? Mama's not get you everything. Snoop Dogg don't have no brothers and sisters over there? I, hell if I know, he might. <laughs> <laughs> he might. Damn. Right. Uh, uh, Sipping on gin and juice yeah, over in right, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah but, right. but, but, but what it was, uh, every 50, you, you, okay, you got in the bush for 15 days on patrol. Getting down bush, mortar attacks. People receptin' on landmines. People getting their legs done, blow it off. Uh, that's just a normal week. Right, right. It, it, wow. it, it, become, it become normal. You got uh, no Vietnamese bodies up, bodies up and down. Highway 19, what we would do, there's two ways we, 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 would, we would do it. Call the engineers out with a bulldozer, dig a hole, throw them in the hole, put lime, put lime on top of them so they wouldn't smell, cover them up. We could take diesel and pour on top of them, mm. take all their shit, light them up, and let them burn up. Once, yeah. once diesel gets through burning, they shit left with ashes. How was that mm -hmm. smell, though? It had to hit you. No, no, no. Once, no. once you burn up, you take off. You can smell it. Yeah. You, you, you tell them about flesh. Now, how, yeah. how long did you end up staying in Vietnam for? 11 months, 11 months, 26 days. Matter of fact, let me tell you, with the last firefight, have you guys watched the movie Hamburger Hill? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, let me see. I got a picture in my phone right now. I took it May 9th. I had 24 days no wake up, and I was going home. You're counting these days. Well, hell yeah, you count. <laughs> he said, hell yeah. What? I'm <laughs> counting this yeah. shit. I right. love you too, playboy. When you, when, you get, when you get to 100, 100 days in Vietnam, you buy a short time as calendar. Everybody, the, the Vietnamese made them. Now everybody, I had a foot, okay? Started from my big toe. And so I count down days. When you get down to your to your to your, your, your pinky. Yeah, that's 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 really Vietnam. 
So what happened was I took this picture May 9th. May 10th, the fight for Hamburg Hill started. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It, was, it wasn't the Hamburg Hill then. Mm-hmm. It was Hill 937. It was 101st Airborne Division screaming niggas. They got poor intel, you know, intelligence meant, meant everything in Vietnam. So the fight started for three days. We didn't hear about it. That fourth day, I was back at base camp. I, I, I wasn't going out on patrol then. So I was a radio operator. R, they call it RTO, Romeo Tango Oscar. The radios on our track was different when you're in the bush because you just talking to me and you talking. Yeah. The radio room, we talking to everybody. Air Force pilots, everything, you know what I'm saying? And I was really green to it, okay? But this white guy from Vegas, he, he took him to school. So the fourth day, we started hearing about, man, they're fighting today. It's a big fight on, 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 on uh, Hill 937. It's like you gang banging. Hey, man. <laughs> they are this black. No, no, it's like when you gang banging, you know, mm-hmm. you go to some neighborhoods where you know it's going to be some shit. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, Vietnam was like that. You know, some places you had been time and time again, you know, you know get, get, get ready to fight. Over there. Yeah. Get ready to fight. So the fourth day, we started hearing about it. Everybody in Vietnam heard about it. The f- fifth day, my captain said, hey, Bernardo, get on their frequency. We, we had these big ass antennas, so I got on their frequency. Guess what I heard? All I heard was AK 47s, mortar rounds, Claymore mines, RPGs. I mean, it's like, it's not like a 4th of July fireworks show. That's day four. Day five, they still fight. Damn. Okay. Day six, they still fight. Everybody's man. This, no, that's how Vietnam is. Day seven, they still fight. Day eight, they still fight. Full blown. Oh, full blown. Day night, the ninth day, they still fight. It took the heel on May twentieth. The fight started on May tenth. It took the heel on May twentieth. They lost over four hundred guys, man. It was so many guys got was getting killed. They had to fly some to Tokyo because hospitals in Vietnam wasn't big enough to hold everybody. So that's that's what they named Hamburger Hill. In every major firefight in Vietnam, we always gave a name. I give an example. The Marines fought at Kaysan. You probably heard about Kaysan, the seven to seven day siege. They fought for seven to seven days with five thousand Marines against twenty thousand North Vietnamese. Yeah. That had, think about it. Seven, you fight seven to seven days. They hitting yeah. you. They hitting you two or three times a day. Not with more, they hitting you with mortar rounds, but he, but they hitting you with one twenty millimeter artillery rounds. The first round, the, the fight started. I think like November, first part of November. The first round they shot, it was five thousand Marines. They hit the ammo dump, and this is what they do. They okay, hit the ammo dump, right? Now your ammunition is gone. When they when they hit the ammo dump, eighteen Marines got killed. Bam, just like that. It exploded for forty eight hours. So now your ammo is gone. Now all you got is your ammo on you, right? So now they know you got to fly it in. They real smart, right? Okay, you got to fly this shit in. They start finding those C one thirties. They start blowing them up. What they start doing is start finding low to let the uh, TIA down and just drop it off. Okay, you you drop it off, but now you guys go out there and get it. Yeah, yeah. The they they know yeah. they know that. Mm-hmm. So when you go when you go out there to get it, they're waiting. They they, they try to drop around mortar rounds in on you. They had outposts with little, little fire bases and shit. They, all all those guys got killed. Mm-hmm. I lost a homeboy of mine. I grew up with in Mississippi. He got killed in case, son. If I was, but the bad part about Vietnam, after the case, son, we left. We always take a hill and then we leave. Like Hamburg Hill, we left. Mm-hmm. They come right back. Yeah. Right. So so why I lose all those lives? But I came to find out that in Vietnam, they was drafting Latinos and blacks and Puerto Ricans just like that. Easy. Right. Easy, because I'm going to tell you why. Our population was growing too fast. It was to cut down on reproduction. Then they was, they, was, wow. they, they was drafting poor white people, not the rich ones. Mm-hmm. Rich white boys, Katie. Right. So the white mm-hmm. it was white poor kids they was drafting, and think about it it was it's like fifty eight thousand four hundred seventy nine four hundred seventy nine guys got killed in Vietnam. Think about how many kids they would have. They were eighteen nineteen years old. Right. Prime. So think about yeah. it. So so that many people that got killed. Think about how many kids they would have. Yeah. I can sure. when I started going to West LA, LA College College I started doing research on Vietnam. Come to find out they've been fighting for four four thousand years. They beat Genghis mm-hmm. Khan. Mm-hmm. They beat the Japanese. They beat the Chinese. France had held it down Vietnam for 100 years because Vietnam grow more rice than any country in the world. That's why he calls it the jewel of Asia. They got opium, China white, the best weed. So, came to find, I thought about that. We go to these, these countries like Iraq. Bush then went to Iraq because the Bush family's in oil. Yes. That's why they stayed there for so long. They made billions of dollars in maintaining. So, wars are started by old men. 
They fought by the young. Yes, sir. Okay. By yeah. old white men. Right. They, they, old right. white men. Old we got shit man. to do. And you got black and brown men fighting their wars. Yeah, they, they, they come at us. That's some real shit. Okay. That's some but let me shit. say this again. It was Latinos, blacks, and the Puerto Ricans. We was the bad motherfuckers. Holding it down over there. Goddamn right we was. Yeah, the, so, the, 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 Viet, the Vietnamese, when you first saw them, you thought, these are these little boys, little kids, because they're so small. They look like they, they were kids. <laughs> but, they they was, were, but they were killers. Man, what? <laughs> and people don't realize in Vietnam, this is what, this is what happened. When, when, they, when, they, when they ran the France out in 1954 in Nien Bien Phu, they ran them out. France told President Johnson, don't go to Vietnam because you're fighting enemy that's invisible. He's not all we the United States. We got all this firepower. We went around. Okay. They beat us on foot. Okay. So that being said, when I got to Vietnam, they had, uh, they had under, they, uh, I'll give you an example. The 25th Infantry Division built a fire base in Kuchi. The yeah, 101st had moved out there with up north. They didn't realize when they built this big fire base, they, they built it right on top of the Vietnamese headquarters. 241 miles of underground highway. Hospitals, living quarters, into Saigon. So when they finished building it, every night they was getting lit up. They was getting hit. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And Vietnam, these they small people, right? They had this, this block, this uh, big piece of concrete. You could slide it back and pop up and fall back down the invisible. They finally figured it out. You heard about the tunnel rats. Yes. You go down the tunnels? Yes. That's, how they, that's, that's how, how they came about. Down south, they had tunnels. Where I was, they had caves. Okay? I'm quite sure you, get, you guys probably, a lot of Latino guys love, they love Marines. I noticed that a lot of mm-hmm. Latino guys love joining Marines, right? Yes. Gun ho. Right. They gun ho, right? Yes. They, they, they like that, mm, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you, you talk to any Latino guy that was in Vietnam my age, he said the same thing. You fight the enemy, you can't see, but you damn sure feel them. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. That part. Yeah. So, so do you have a number that you've killed in Vietnam? One day we killed 73. I had, I had 34 days to wake up. I just came back from R&R, rest and, rest and recreation. I came yeah. back from Bangkok, Thailand. They send you the replacements over to Vietnam three months before you leave. I was a uh, uh, Latino guy. His name was Danny. He was from uh, Redondo Beach. Yes. He's about maybe five, 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 six. And I was training him. So when I did leave, he, he, he knew what, what he was up against. Mm-hmm. Came back from Bangkok. We got that pulling guard deal one night at this pump station. And he, uh, I said, uh, I said, Danny, I said, uh, uh, you guys took it, but you guys took it, getting hit every night while I was going to yep, every night. Every night, they, they would fire four RPGs. We have our guns pointed red towards the hill they was firing from. We don't know what he, whether we got them or not. He said, it was still getting hit. So we we, heard, we was listening to uh, David Ruffin. He was, singing, he was singing this song called My Whole World Is In It. The, the moment mm-hmm. you left me, we had that spoken. I was on the second shift, second shift of guard duty was from 12 to 6 in the morning. I, 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 I put a guard dude for three hours. Okay. You sleep for three hours. I'll wake you up. You got the last three hours. About 115, because that's when you used to come to hit your ass. They shot 12 RPGs. I got wounded twice that night. They shot three from the back, three from the front, three from both sides. You can see them coming that night. It's like a flash. Mm-hmm. We look over like this. They come right over here. We were so fucking high, man. They, they ain't going to explode. They exploded right in front of us, man. <laughs> I got about 20 pieces of fragments in my yeah. neck right now. Got hit right here, right here. I see the scar. Right. Mm-hmm. Danny lost pieces here. By me having 34 days on wake up, I'm, I'm, I'm a hardcore vet now. Danny was brand new. I have to give him a credit. He held his ground that night. I put my CVC helmet on, called the fire base. I, was, I need fire support. They had our grid and everything. I said, man, go out by a thousand meters and start bringing it back. I popped the flare. Bam. They go up and you, you pop like this. Damn, mm-hmm. flare goes up like this, shh, pops open, it's a parachute, and you got the flare, it floats like this. I looked out there, here they come. Leaves on top of the head. See, we shoot like this, they shoot like this. All I seen was yelling green tracers coming at us. I jumped on the 60, Danny, uh, he had to thump the M79 grenade launcher. I don't really wait on my boys to wake up so I can fire my big guns. So by that time, I had called in the group, we called them the snakes, the corporate helicopter. No, they come in, uh, uh, that's the thousand rounds right there. I can hear them coming and stuff. I said, all we got to do is hold them off until they, until they get there. Artillery was doing the rest. We killed seven three that night. But it, I didn't get out and I didn't get picked up until about six that morning. My whole uniform was full of blood. And from, from that point on, when I came back from the hospital, they took me out in the bush. I got wounded three times, really two times they took me out in the bush. 
and you go you either go to base camp or go back to the fire base. I chose to go back to the fire base. I'm tell you why. I've been in Vietnam with my boys that long. I can't walk away from them, man. You know, what I'm these are my boys, man. We gonna yes. put it down together. And I'm not gonna. I punk out if I leave them. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm at the fire base, but I wasn't going out. So that's what I did, man. At this, at this point, you're a completely different person than you were a year almost prior to that. I was a full grown man. I mean, you think about it. I was in 200, 241 firefights. Did you ever wow. wake up and kind of have a dream and think you're still at home and wake up and say, what the fuck am I doing? I'm back over here. No, no. In Vietnam, you don't dream. In Vietnam, you don't sleep. Oh, shit. Because once they hit your ass at night, you, not, let me put it this way. But 11 months, when the first time I, the first action I seen, I didn't sleep at night, man. You take power naps, man. You're too, you're too afraid to go to sleep. You can't see nothing for number one. Okay? You're going to sleep. You might wake up with your, with your throat cut. So I, I really never slept in Vietnam. 30 minutes of sleep in Vietnam feel like four or five hours to me. An hour of sleep feel like eight hours. You tired, man. I mean, they, they, constantly, they constantly hitting your ass, man. They wearing you down. They wearing you down, folks. They wear you down like this. So when you do go to sleep, that's when they come get your ass. They come get you at night. But here's another incident I went through. I'm at Pump 6 and 7. This one Saturday morning. And he, I knew it then we was, that, that, my, that my boys from the world of shit. It was at uh, LV Shula. So my lieutenant that came by to check on us, right? So we hear, we hear gunfire, right? It was kind of dense. So he jumps on the radio. He said, what's going on up there? Said, my boys at the other, other LZ said, man, we getting hit. Just like 10.30 on the Saturday the morning. I said, okay. They ready to fight. They could hit you that time in the morning. They ready to fight. He said, pack this shit. Get all the ammunition you can. Let's go help them out. We ride now about maybe a mile and a half. It was a mountain. The crew gets to go around with a mountain. Once you get right around that mountain, it found it sounded like the Fourth of July fireworks show. If shoot more than rounds from this way, shoot more than rounds from that way. But the gun I was on, we started shooting this way. Our guns should reach the mortar too. They started shooting that way. But what they had did, the other shooters sat on top of the hill, right? And what happened was they had, they had been there all night long, so they had, they was there to where no matter how how they, the fire breeze, how they shot back at them, you couldn't hit them. Cause you up here, up here, they down here. Mm-hmm. So we we saw us seeing them moving, and we had a good lieutenant from Texas. I mean, a good a platoon sergeant from Texas named Sergeant Dottery. He was a war monkey. He loves to fight. He said, "Lay back. I'm gonna call an artillery." So I called an artillery. The gunship. They started running. So when they started running, we started shooting at them. We hit a couple of them, but most most of the time they got away. But the hard part, of, the hardest part about Vietnam, after that last shot of fire in the ambush or fire fight, everything get all quiet, right? It might be 120 of them, and you go out there looking for them, and you don't see nobody. They vanish. You're trying to figure out what the hell did they go. They're there. That's the scary part. Yeah. No, they vanish. They go underground. Thank you. They go underground in the tunnels. And in tunnels. Yep. Damn. Yeah. Now, when you say this story, I mean, it's so vivid. It's so still there in your mind. Yeah. How do you deal with this stuff after so many years? Because it has to have something so, on your on your. Well, it's like so this. You, you come home, right? Right. At this point, do you get flashbacks? Have no, you no. ever got flashbacks? No, no. But I don't call them flashbacks. Some guys get flashbacks. Here's yeah. the deal. This deal. You got two kinds of Vietnam vets. You got the ones that don't talk about it. The other ones get flashbacks. I love talking about it to my grandsons and, and Snoop and everybody. Because by me talking about it, I'm releasing it. You feel yes. me? Yes. Yeah. But Therapy. We, but we holding in, man. You still in Vietnam. You know, that's funny because, you know, my dad was in Vietnam as well. Uh-huh. He got drafted in 68 as well. Right. Um, but he didn't talk about it for years, and then he would get the flashbacks. Right. And then in his older age, before he passed, he started talking about it a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I never understood that. Why did he talk about it later in his in his age? And when we were younger, he never talked about it. But we he would go through those flashbacks, and he would chase us around the house, calling us Charlie, and we didn't understand it. Right. And my mom would kick us out of the house. Be like, right. Just come back later, you know. Shit. And yeah, so that's why I was asking you if you, you get those flashbacks. Well, let me tell you, here's the deal. When I was going to my going to my PTSD classes on plumber in, in the valley at the VA, mm-hmm. they would bring the wives in once a week. And this one what wife was, was telling us that she had to, she had to, had, had to get a broom and stand back just to wake her husband up. She's like, if I got too close to him, mm-hmm. he would attack me. Okay, so they were telling these stories, right? I've never had a nightmare. Cause my main thing was when I left Vietnam, I left Vietnam and Vietnam. You left it there. But let me say this. Vietnam's only 24 7, 365. It's, it's only. It's something you can't shake. Your dad couldn't shake it. Can't no Vietnam shake it that was in the bush. You get the ones in the bush couldn't shake it. They had the ones in the rear with the gear, they didn't see no action. But the, the but the ones in the was your dad a Marine? Yes. Okay. He see he was he was the shit like I was. Yeah. Okay. He was so, a radio guy. Radio man. RTO. He was a target. I'm gonna tell you why. 
you are you got the prick twenty five radio. Mm-hmm. You are to you got the big long antenna, and that's the first person. Uh, that's the first. See you. That's the first person they want to shoot. Mm-hmm. Hit the radio, man. Yeah. If you don't grab the radio, you have no communication. Okay. So RTO, RTO on the point, man, was was two, was was two biggest targets in Vietnam when you on patrol. That radio, man, they wanted him real bad. Yeah. And here's the, I'm gonna tell you the thing that I fear most in Vietnam and in the Vietnam vet will tell you snipers. It was always around, picking up one, picking up one here. They could hit you from a mile away. Okay. But but the Marines, this one guy named uh, what was his name uh. Carlos Hescock. Your dad was there when he, when he was in Vietnam. I was there when he killed. They say he killed 93 Vietnamese by wow. himself. You know, snipers is a two-man team. Got mm-hmm. the spotter, got the shooter. Yes. He did it by himself. Damn. A redneck from Arkansas. <laughs> redneck from Arkansas. <laughs> Not really. Uh, now, he made history. Redneck from Arkansas. That was, used to go squirrel and rabbit hunting. And he did it all with the M14. And we, we shoot. His job was to go out there and find the captains, the people who were running the show. Rank. And right then, we would shoot them. He would shoot them like, okay, you shoot them from the back, but you thought you shot them from the front. Mm-hmm. And they would turn around and face that way. They'd give him time to haul ass. Do you ever yes. run into any, let's say, for lack of a better word, rednecks in the, that eventually after the war, they kind of saw you different? Maybe you saw them different? Or no, not even, I got one. I got a real good one for you. We got back from Vietnam. Let me tell, let me, let me tell you about Leaving Vietnam. Yeah, we can just do a whole Vietnam podcast. Yeah, I'm loving exactly. this, man. Yeah, too. Vietnam story. Let me tell you, when I got my orders, man, we was at Camp Run Bay. We had two demo days before we was leaving. And we and let me say this. It was 997 guys got killed the first day in Vietnam. It was 1,441 got killed on your last day of Vietnam. Like they said, in Vietnam, it's better to get killed when you first get there and you don't suffer than to do a whole year and they get killed. Shit. So, oh, so yeah, right, yeah. so 1,441 got killed their last day. That's crazy. Wow. So, so we down at Cameron Run Bay. We all in our duffel bags. And it was our time. It was, uh, it was June, June 1st. It was time for us to leave. So we out there, man, Cameron Run Bay. We out there two days. Everybody smoking shit. And most of us made it back. We, we didn't lose that many guys, man. And we was waiting for this plane to land. I went, uh, back then, when the plane land, guys unloading, coming to Vietnam. They changed pilots and, and, and put gas in it. Guys leaving. He jumped on the plane, right? He started calling out names. They called him, came to my name, Vernell Vernado. Went well. Get on the airplane, man. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't even close the door. Cause we, we still in Vietnam. We, we know they got SR2 to our, our, our missiles to shoot down the plane. We know they got mortar rounds. We had been there long enough to realize we still in deep shit. Mm-hmm. Cause we, we still in Vietnam. Cameron Ryan Bay Post has been half as safe, right? When they closed that door, my man, there's no lie. He closed that door. He, he started revving that plane up. So going down that runway, we didn't say shit. Everybody was wearing a watch back then. We had the Seiko watch. That was a real popular watch. I bought one in Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay, R and R. The plane takes off. You over, t- over South China Sea. Cameron, Cameron Baby's right there on the South China Sea. We looking at our watch. Like ten minutes fly by. Fifteen minutes pass by. We said to ourselves, "You ain't far enough away for this motherfucker." Get out there. He did a forty-five degree bank. He said, "I'm sure you, you guys, in Vietnam for the last time." Wow. You fly all the way down the coast of Vietnam. We seen flashes. We knew somebody was easy to get killed in a, in a firefight. When we got away from Vietnam, the whole plane erupted because we could not believe we made, that we made it out in this mug in one piece. Yeah. Right. Okay? We couldn't believe it, man. We got the screaming and hollering, man, from that point on, all the way from Cameron Bay to Tokyo, that plane got all quiet, man. When we got back to Fort Lewis, uh, back to uh, McCord Air Force Base in Washington, we all got out and kissed the ground, man. That's how bad Vietnam was. We kissed the ground. We glad to be back in America. But the bad part about it, we got to the airport and watched in Seattle, Washington. They was calling us baby killers. Yeah, yeah. Don't want shit at right. us. You guys come back. Your dad probably tell you about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, baby killers spitting on us. Thought we looking at this shit, man. We couldn't believe it. That's something I would never forget. Long if I live, no, no Vietnam vet. Every Vietnam vet would tell you we got treated like shit. We didn't get no damn parade. We didn't get that ticker tape parade like them guys from Iraq. But we was we the real we the real heroes. So, man. so so what was the reason why they called you baby killers? Is it because there was babies actually being left? They no, I'm tell you why. The Vietnam War was was a TV war. Mm-hmm. It was on TV every damn day. Yes. Right. Some 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 moms there seen their kids get killed on TV. Mm-hmm. Try that one. So we got back, man. Back then they was protesting for burning up draft cards. The hippies. Hip hippies of racial tension and shit. It get worse. I could tell lady doing the same shit. And when I got my, when I see my brothers and sisters, they, they look at me all funny and shit. They thought all Vietnam best was crazy. This is when I see my mom and dad. I'm thinking they're gonna give me a big hug. You all right, boy? You crazy? Mm-hmm. Oh, How many people you killed? It was like 
Nobody wanted to be around me, man. Yeah. That broke my fucking heart, man. Nobody yeah. wanted to be He's around me. this country and everybody now, disowns you. But the what make it even worse, in 69, I still seen the same sign, white color. Mm-hmm. That doesn't change. You just came and fought and put your life on the I'm line. Lying, but I'm still black and I still can't do this and I can't do that. Wow. You're, you're, mm-hmm. And we'll get into that segment. This is a perfect time to switch to that. Right. We were talking about Muhammad Ali. Um, his famous word, he said, no yellow man ever called me the ER word. No, you didn't, no one never called him a nigga. And the bad part about it, what broke my heart was when he took his license from him. Yeah, this this had how, how the white man was operating, operating back then. Probably sorry, and still is to be honest. To be, to a point, yes. He he's just a little bit more uh, 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 conservative with it. Back then, if you was black and and I give you an example, Meg Evers, uh, uh, Emmett Till, uh, all them guys who got killed. If you was fighting for your voting rights and you was a civil, a civil rights activist, and you hung, you stayed in Mississippi, you was gonna get killed. In 1965, they started bringing in Freedom Riders. Are you guys familiar with Freedom Riders? No. Freedom Riders, it was white people. Bernie Sanders was one. A lot of actors, Paul Bernie doing. Sa- really? Bro, uh, uh, Paul Newman, a lot of actors was coming down from back east. They helped us vote called Mississippi. is the poorest state in the United States. Okay? You guys know what a slam window is? No. Up in the Delta, where they raised c- uh, cotton, catfish, and rice, a slam window is like, it's not a window. It's a board. You pull it, got a screen up there. You, you pull it out. For ventilation in the daytime. At night, you close it. Back then, my grandmother and grandfather didn't get electricity until 1957. Back then, people had kerosene lamps. You feel me? Yeah. They had wooden soles. Okay, that's the area I came from. Okay? And back then, man, like I said, they didn't segregate my high school until 1972. And when they did, the white teachers wasn't te- teaching black shit. Okay? Right now, if I speak, this is 2023. Yes. Mississippi, Alabama, when they had a prom, guess what? The white kids have this at the recreation center. The black kids have this in the cafeteria. I mean, the gym. Oh, wow. They had, they separate. White, black. Ain't nothing changed, man. And I'm 73. I'm going to 74 years old. Damn. Okay? Okay? Like I'm telling you today, Latinos get a bad rap. I was at a party when I, I, live, in, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, right? And somebody was saying something about the Latinos. We went where I said, hey, man, it's like this. I said, I tell you what. The work, I said, the work the Latinos doing now, I did that growing up. I said, don't, I said, don't knock them. I said, here's the deal. I said, they are the economy. I said, if they stop working in the fields, picking our produce, if they stop cleaning up hotels, they stop babysitting, for two weeks, you're going to feel it in your damn pockets. I said, don't ever say nothing about Latinos. I said, this is what I told them. Latinos are unified, which the blacks are not. Black lives, talking about black lives matter? No, they couldn't matter. We killing one another left and right. But number two, Latinos, when they have parties, ain't no drama. They have they they have parties. They hardworking people. Y'all, you can talk about them as long as you want to. I said they are they are our economy. So I I for I defend it, y'all, because these young black kids don't, don't understand what it is. You know what I'm saying? They grew up with growing up watching TV and playing games. I've lived reality. I'm knowing for a fact blacks and Latino has been treated worse than anybody in the United States. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ain't no doubt in my goddamn mm-hmm. mind. I just keep it real. So let's talk about the civil rights era. Mm. Where were you during that whole time, and how was your life going during the civil rights era? Well, I had no choice, but I'm going to tell you what. Back then, they, uh, King, Jefferson Jackson, Abernathy, and who else? Uh, all the civil rights uh, uh, people, they, they was marching back then. Okay. They started off from Alabama trying to get black to voting rights. Mississippi, Tennessee. But Alabama was the worst. But they had George Wallace and, and, and Bull Connor. Boy, and, and George Wallace was always saying, "Any old niggas going to school with white kids in my state?" Meg Evers was the first black in Mississippi to go to Ole Miss. Think about it. How you how you like to go to school? You got the National Guard, you got to walk into school and walk you walk you back home. Ow. That's how it was back then. But he brought the color color berry. Right. Okay. Back then, man, I never get 1963. We was at home watching TV. We had just came back from church, and they bombed that church in, in Birmingham, Alabama. He bombed the uh, 16th Street Church. Four black girls got killed. Okay. Everything swept up under the rug. Can I take a break out of your bathroom? Oh, yeah, yes, for, yes, sure, yes, for, yes, sure. Yes. for sure. For sure. For sure. Put the camera over here <laughs> real quick. I, I, got some, I got a surprise for you guys anyways. Go ahead. How am I doing so far? Hey, show, show me where the rest was at. Hey, hey, and, uh, hey, why don't you come sit over here real quick and uh, join, join the party. While he, yeah, he's going to show you where the rest was at right now real quick. Come on over here. We got we got a surprise guest for you while uh, while while we're waiting for him. Come on, baby boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> What's up, man? Oh. What's up, Toes, man? Oh, man. H- how you doing, Playboy? I'm feeling good, man. Just touched down to L.A., you know what I'm saying? Just out here moving and grooving. Man, uh, damn, this, this is an amazing story, brother. Hey, he's he's dope. Like, he's, you know what I like about him? I was just telling my homie, like, he's down to earth. Like, he, like, ever since me and him tapped in, it's like, it's like, it's, it's just, he's humble. He's, no, he's uh, a real you know what guy. I'm saying? I mean, he's a real guy, been through yeah, some shit. You know but... what I mean? And, and and he's real. That's that's what I love about him. So what what are you, what are you doing with uh, Pop? Some boy, talk to us. Uh, Come on, break huh? it down. Actually, you know what? what I mean, what, what he's he's start? actually uh, looking for guidance from myself. You know, for my expertise and what I do, um, okay. and helping him out work on with an artist that he's working with, and um, you know, uh, he enjoys my you know, uh, not enjoys he. I could tell that he's being he's keying in on some of the things that I'm. Um, um, telling him and and he's learning with me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, uh, with the artist that he's talking about right. that he's that he's working with, but um, at the same time, you know, we have a, a few common friends and and it's just been a great relationship, man. And That's today's right. the first time I met him. Actually, you man, know what I'm saying? We've, on the phone all no, the time. we've been on the phone we, damn near every day. We we, oh, wow. we 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 know we in the business. Oh, he's got yeah, some great yeah, energy, you know? man. And we got a badass album coming out, oh, and the man. album. See, and this album, I let him tell him, this album is an old album, but it never been put out on digital platforms. So it was, okay. Oh, it's never put out. So, yeah, it, no, it was on CD, but it never been put Back out. Back in the day. On, yeah, yeah, never hit digital. Yeah. And I mean, it got Snoop Dogg, Daz, it got all the hitters, Be Legit, everybody yeah. up on there. Is it- the West Side, it's the return of the West Side yeah. Riders. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. You know what I'm saying? The return Pops of the West Side. bringing it back, huh? No, he's bringing it back. So, right. you know, and um, there's a big story behind it, so... I'm gonna let him tell so, it. So why, why, why bless us with with uh with his uh why bless us with his uh, interview, man? Talk to me, baby. I mean, you know, uh, well, hey, shout out my boy Six Fold Joe from Richmond, California. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, that that was the person that brought me and him together, and um, you know, and through that relationship we both have with Six Fold, uh, who's an iconic uh, uh street legend in, out there in the Bay, up out of Richmond. That's California, right. what's up, my rich town folks? Right. North Hello, Richmond, man. to be exact. Yeah, I mean, ah. you know, I represent six folk to the fullest. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, right now, you know, he's a uh, he's he, he he's fighting a a a, 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 a health issue right, right now. But you know what I'm saying? And, you know, on, on his way so, back. Yep. But that's how me and uh, Papa Snoop came involved with each other, and then we started chopping it up. And I was able to get the album, get everything together. But he seen how fast. Like, I'm talking fast. Like, when they started talking, I'm like, boom, what? Huh, huh? I'm talking, uh, 24-hour fast. I'm going to get that, bam, bam, bam. Got everything rocking. And um, now we here. Yeah, and, yeah, um, that's But right. the relationship, you know. Okay, here go. Here we go. Here comes the man, the legend. Right, right. Man. Go you the wrong seat, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're my seat, player. Yeah, man. Well, it's a crank crack. Welcome back. Again. Welcome back. Right, yeah, thanks, man. Uh, Let's get back to this incredible yeah, journey yeah, yeah. That, that we're on here. Yeah. So what What I want to ask is, is your Purple Heart. I got three. You got three of them. What? Right. How did that come about? Wounded, being wounded. We get wounded, you get a Purple Heart. So you come back to the States, you get a letter in the mail, somebody calls you up. No, when I, when I get back to the States, I was staying with my brother in L.A. on 6th, 7th Arlington, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I was surprised that, that my LT gave me, I, I got uh, three Purple Hearts. Bronze Stars, Shit. Medal of Achievement, Sharpshooter, Marksman. Mm-hmm. So they sent it to me when I got back home. It shocked me. Yeah. Okay, so I got three purple hearts. And I, those, those medals I got. Man, it's, uh, I didn't even know that. No. No, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. major. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's. I mean, a purple heart is, is one of the highest uh, no, medals the, you can get, right? No, no, Medal of Honor. Medal, medal of Honor. Okay. Right, right. But to get three purple hearts, yeah, I mean, yeah, just yeah. love. Mm-hmm, yeah. Wow. So yeah. we were we were talking about the the civil rights and mm. uh, how how you were in that era and how what you what you saw with, mm. with your own eyes. Oh man, I seen I seen a lot of things, man. I mean, it, back then, like I said, if you if you was black back in the day, you had to deal with all that, all that, all that crap. The white men, like I said, I, I seen a difference between rich white people and poor white people. It was the poor white people that's in lack of. Give you a prime example. When a white guy is poor, he poor. A uh, black can be poor, you never know it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he gonna fake the funk. You go to get, get, get him a nice suit, walk around like he got something. He really ain't got shit. <laughs> no, no, I'm just keeping it real. That's no, how you that, are. Right, I'm, I'm just keeping are. it real. You are. But that's why call, that's why white people call poor white people white trash. You ever, th- you ever heard that? Th- yeah, that absolutely. Are you the rednecks? 
one of the two. So I heard all this. I heard I've heard all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so now let's let's jump. You're you're out of Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Uh, what what year did you leave Vietnam? I left Vietnam uh, June first, nineteen sixty nine. Sixty nine. So let's say let's jump up to seventy five. What are you doing in nineteen seventy five? Well, let's, let's jump 1971. Let's do it. I got out in 1970, and I went to school for the post office because my oh. sister-in-law and my sister, two sisters worked at the post office. And I just fly home to L.A. every now and then. And my, back then, they had, remember special delivery? They had station wagon. Special delivery, <laughs> special delivery is like overnight delivery now. And she would park her, park her, her post office her, her station wagon in her garage, and she'd be home for three or four hours cooking and watching TV. I said, you at work? She said, I'm still getting paid. She said, the post office hired veteran. So I went to school for the post office. When I get out in 1970, mm-hmm. the post office hired me March 1970. Because back then they had jobs then. Think about it, 1970. Yeah. Everything was changing. Versus the fifth was when I grew up when the cars didn't have air conditioning. Our cars didn't have seat belts, you know what I'm saying? Now they're making cars to air conditioning, V8s. Because back then I grew up with three on the tree or three on the floor. Yeah. Stick shift, right? That's right. Okay. So that being said, I'm looking and then the po- back then, the post office was starting you out with three dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Minimum wage was one ten back then. Oh wow, that's good you're money. making good money. Yeah, right. With a little bit of overtime, I, I, I was up to six. What, I work- what state are you in now? I'm in L.A. Oh, you're in L.A. I'm in L.A. I started working on Thirty Nine Crenshaw at twenty years old. Okay, so I was making three twenty five hours, but I worked a lot of overtime. But five years, I saved my money because everything in L.A. was cheap then. I had someone buy me a house. But a friend of mine I worked with here bought a duplex up here off Pico. Pico and uh, off La Brea. Oh, Pico. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, between between uh, Pico and and Washington. Nice duplex. Back then, it was going for $37,000. So I said, man, I'm like, well, if I only use $5,000, I can buy me a duplex. So I found one in Inglewood on Fairview and Buckler. They wanted thirty two five for it. Then my first time buy you, I, 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 I didn't know how to bring them down. Bring the price down. <laughs> you don't know how to negotiate it. Yeah, yeah. No, but no, I'm a first time buyer. You know, first time right. buyers, man. That's I mean, you you really don't know, don't know, uh, don't know nothing, right? Right. I got that, okay. And by that time, when I bought that, I was making like six bucks an hour, but I was still working overtime. They gave me nine dollars an hour. But think about it, gas back then was fifty cents a gallon. Everything was cheap, yeah, everything okay. Was everything now. everything was cheap. But what happened was, 1979, I went to bed one night. They, had, they came up with this uh, thing called Proposition 13. Your parents know about it. Proposition 13, that's when everything in L.A. went up. Houses went up. Rent control went out and they, uh, uh, went out the door. They could charge you. You might come on one day, you're paying $100 for rent. The most I would, I would pay for rent in L.A. was, LA was 145 on Farmdale and Rodeo Road across from Dwight's High School. 79, all that changed. Went to bed one night, my place was worth about 50000 Woke up the next morning, I'm over 100 Wow. Okay, that's when everything started going up. So that being said, it might, have, might sound like it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was. Cause you can do a lot with it back then. Yes. You feel? Now I'm now I'm uh, moving fast forward. The post office is showing you for twenty dollars an hour. I got two buddies of mine in Detroit. They still working. They made one hundred fifty thousand dollars in three years in a row because they work a lot of overtime. So they, I worked at the post office post office nineteen seventy to nineteen ninety five, and I retired. Yeah, but but there's, a, there's, a, there's a there's a long uh, there's a long part that you missed out there in the post office. But before we get to that, when did you meet? Uh, Snoop Dogg's mom. Oh, that's that's easy. Me and Snoop Dogg's mom grew up together. Really? I right, let me take it back on that. Yeah, let's scroll back <laughs> yeah, to memory yeah. lane, baby. Okay, yeah. back my back. Okay, my mom, my mom had twelve kids, right? The block I lived on it was over fifty kids. Cause back then, wasn't no birth control. People was having babies left and right. Okay, like she was selling gas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in in LA. This is Mississippi. Mississippi. Okay. Okay, we both born in Mississippi, right? Mm-hmm. So Snoop's back then, if you if you was a black woman and you were pregnant, a white doctor would not deliver your baby. What? Stu's great grandmother, Ms. Maude Tate, her name was on all 12 of my mom's children's birth certificate. She was a midwife. They had midwives. Do you guys know what midwife yes, is? Yes. They come to your house and deliver your baby. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So she's delivered all 12 of my, ma- my mom's kids. Every kid in my block, she delivered. She was, she was the best midwife in my hometown. So Stu's uh, mother grew up a mile from me. So I grew up with Stu's grandmother, grew up with his uncles. One of his uncles was my classmates. Cause her kids was around about the same age as I was. They moved to California in 1963. They moved to Long Beach. So we started writing one of the letters. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, 
14, she like she like 12 years old. We writing, you know, you remember love letters? Yeah, you, God. yeah. Of course. you 12, 13 years old, you yeah. think you're in love. But I call it puppy love. That's, well, well. that's the best kind. Right. <laughs> so my sister got married to, to, to Stu's mom's brother. So in 1966, I moved, I moved to San Francisco. So I used to ride the bus down from Frisco to see Snoop's mom. So that's how, that's how I knew Snoop's mom. I've been doing it all my life. Yes. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. And, and then you guys finally hooked up. and. Well, what happened was, man, we always said we wanted a baby. But what happened was when I was in Vietnam, my sister-in-law wrote me a letter that said, oh, Beverly's pregnant. I got pissed off because we, I was going to get married to her when I came back from Vietnam. Mm-hmm. But what happened was when I got back from Vietnam, she was pregnant with, with Snoop's older brother, oldest brother, Jerry. We called him Dirty Love. Seven to one. Dirty left. I've heard that in the raps. <laughs> right. So in seven to one, we still kicking it, and she get pregnant with Snoop. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm 22 years old. I wasn't ready for no baby. Yeah. So Snoop, it's a long story behind him. Anyway, Snoop, I used to go pick up Snoop, but but he'd always be crying and stuff. God, I mean, <laughs> God, we, God, his mom was young, I was young, and I'm, I'm still out there in the street. <laughs> so that's how that's how, that's how, how, how far me and Snoop's mom go back. I know, I know her family, her aunties. I mean, her, her family, great, sure. great, great, everybody. Yeah. yeah. So That's right. now, now let's get into you're you're in the post office, but you ended up actually moving out to uh, Detroit. Detroit, right? You, right. You, you said that's like your second hometown. That's my second hometown. I spent ten years there from eighty five to ninety five. And those were some vicious years out there. Man, let me tell you, here's the deal. Detroit have always I've always heard stories about Detroit. I had a cousin, a first cousin living there, and. I went to Detroit for the first time, what, 19, what, 81. And Detroit, first thing I noticed, it was a party town. It was different in L.A. You know, Detroit was mostly black, right? They was hustlers. Everybody was wearing meat coats, the alligator shoes and stuff. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 it was, they was fly up there. It was pimping out there. All that. Okay. So what happened was they had job openings in Detroit. So me, me and a couple of my boys said, man, we're we going to go to Detroit. So... My duplex, I had enough money to buy, to buy my house when I got to Detroit. Because when I got to Detroit, I started working on the, on the west side. You guys know about Eight Mile Road? You see the movie with Eminem, Eight, Eight Mile yeah, Road? Eight yeah, mile. yeah. So what is Eight Mile for those of us that don't okay, know? Okay, in Detroit, they got Five Mile Road, Six Mile Road, eight, uh, Seven Mile Road, Eight, eight Mile Road. It goes all, all the way up to 25 Mile Road. Okay. A lot of people get confused. They just roads. They, they're really a main drag. So uh, I wrote them a letter. They accepted my transfer. So I moved to Detroit. I got to Detroit. November 1985. Okay, I'm staying with my cousin. I started working on the west side. And I noticed that in Detroit, man, everybody was going to clubs. Detroit's a party, it's a party city. The women drink more liquor than guys up there. Okay. <laughs> and they love they, 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 they love cocaine. You seen a woman in Detroit with her nails done and this pinky finger was like a, out like that. She stole the coke. You can tell them up right off the bat. And they dress up a lot. The women, Detroit is the hair capital of the world for blacks. The what capital of the world? The hair. They oh, love. Okay. They they do be, they do they do better hair in Detroit than anywhere in the inner city, in the United States. Take it from me. Okay. okay. Guys wearing meat coats. Uh, back then they was wearing rabbits. They was wearing a uh, Ralph snake. Uh, uh, yeah. Alligator shoes. And what what cars are they driving? Oh, they 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 drive like they driving like Cadillacs and 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 uh, Deuce and quarters and stuff. <laughs> it's like some ah. Superfly type. Right. Hey. And in, in the summertime they drove the good cars. In the wintertime they drove Jeeps. Cause Detroit it get cold as hell. It snows a lot, mm-hmm. right? So the, the first incident I had in Detroit, I had been in Detroit maybe about seven, eight months. I'm delivering mail one day. I was working some overtime. The, my post I was right here. Was, it was uh, they had a street called Pembroke. It was a street called Stoper. I'm delivering mail one day, right? Snowing like hell. It's January, cold as hell. But you really don't feel the cold weather because the clothes in Detroit are different. L.L. Bean, they, they, mm-hmm. no matter how cold it gets, as long as you're moving, you ain't going to feel nothing. So I'm walking up the block, putting bill in people's houses. There was a car sitting out there running. It was two guys in the car. I ain't shit. I ain't thinking nothing of it. This is my last block. I'm trying to get through so I can get out in this cold weather, right? So I, I make my loop. They call it parking loop. I make my loop to come back down to my Jeep. So by the time I get to the house, right across from the house, where the, the, these guys went to with guns, I'm putting bill in the mailbox and... and I seen this one guy knocking on the door. Bam, bam, bam. These two guys broke out the side door. They started running towards me. So he, he was left-handed, tall, light complexion, bro. Little young kid. Started shooting. I heard, pat, pat. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I, I got to be seeing shit. <laughs> and I seen, I seen that smoke and them, them shell cases falling on the ground. It was a big bush on his right, on the right hand side. I just rolled, I went to my went Vietnam into my mode. in my Vietnam mode <laughs> and, right. and rolled over the bush onto the onto the ground. And he shot two of them. He didn't kill him. He shot him. And here come the police. You know, they, they asked me questions and stuff. I told him I don't know nothing. You know, I didn't want to get involved in this stuff. Cause my boss house was right there, the next block over. Right. 
First incident. Okay. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I, I begin to figure out, okay, Detroit might be what they said is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, no. So another incident I went through, we on North, we on North Fork going towards Living North. Living North is the main drag, okay? And me and my boys, we used to be out there parking our Jeeps and smoking weed and stuff. And we see these two cars speeding down North Fork. And we saw, was the guy in the, <laughs> in the back of the car shooting at the, at the car in the back. Guy in the back hanging out the window shooting at them. It was like a bad dream. <laughs> so what we did, we all crawl up on our Jeep. Because mm-hmm. they shoot, man. These, I mean, these cats are real. Pow, 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 pow. They get down to the living noise. There's a, gross, uh, a, a, a drugstore called Glorious Pharmacist. She was in our zone, so we knew it, right? They drove into the parking lot. So they was going to run inside run the store and start shooting. So Gloria, you know, everything in Detroit got, got basements. She runs in the basement and locked the door. You had a shootout right there. I said, damn, man, these cats. This is for real out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's for real, man. And then I, I was at a, a, at a cabaret one night. I, I didn't know what a cabaret was. A cabaret is the big dance to have in, have in Detroit. Party, that was like a big party, right? I'm down on the east side on, on Outer Drive and Sherwood Avenue. We had, we had this like cabaret. We, so they had, two, they had the front, they had the back. Beat man, and I'm trying to put, I'm trying to put me up, put me up, babe, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, a fight break out in the next room, and the fight started coming that way. Then it became a free fall. For you know what I did? I grabbed my skin and and walked with me. And my boys walked outside, right? That's the next incident. Then maybe about a month later, I'm at this other club on Finkel off Living Noise, right down from St. Francis home from boys and people in Detroit know, know what I'm talking about. At this club, so I, in the winter time, I drove my four wheel drive truck. I was throwing like here. We all had our overcoats on, our scarves and shit. You know, walking to this club. These cats pull up in the van, jump out out of the van, go inside the club, and here come these guys running towards my truck. They start shooting. We had to crawl beneath my truck. And that's how Detroit was, man. Man, Detroit seemed like it was, it, it was worse than Compton back yeah. in the days, but baby. The, the, the word I'm getting right now is even worse now. Because they're shooting back at the police. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. But Detroit, like I said, Detroit was a, was a part of town. <laughs> You, drug drug dealers. Uh, I mean, did you ever run into any like uh, very well known drug dealers out there? Oh yeah, I knew I knew Maserati Rick. Maserati Rick. White boy, well, y'all want to know about white boy Rick? Yes, sir. I saw him twice before he went to prison. I, me and my, me and Stupid just moved into the house on White Hill. Got the, the West Side. I thought the hard guys was on the West Side. No, no, it was the East Side. They was hard. They had uh, Demetrius Callaway got killed. Maserati, Maserati Rick got killed. Boogaloo Brown got killed. They was all over the place, man. They had some cold yeah. names back yeah, then right? too, man. They had some real the, yeah, a, but you get, you get history what, right here. So when I when I transferred to the east side from the west side, I noticed all the drug dealers. They had stash houses, right? And they had a big, you know, those big pit bulls. They have to show up with the fat legs. Yeah, yeah. Like they had one at the front door with a big chain around his neck. On the at the back door, they had boobies. You know what a booby a booby is? No, a big booby was big a big ass dog, look hairy. Sharp teeth. They had, they had had him at the back door, and they would tell tell us, man, look here, just just throw the mail on the front porch. Oh, shit. They, 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 but they didn't live there. It was a stash house, right? Mm-hmm. So this on the east side. This 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 close to the D piece. You got the east side and the D piece. And I I would go down to a place called Shake Land on Alter Road, and they that's where all the drug dealers uh, 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 collaborated at. Most of them drug dealers back then, they they started off with, uh, selling heroin, and they went from heroin to, to to blow, but they was connected to Escobar. Okay. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, these are drug dealers. These, I mean, I said drug dealers, drug dealers. Oh boy, some real shit. Oh, the real shit, the real deal, Holyfield. So Detroit is a tough city, man. One thing about Detroit, if you mind your business. And stayed in your lane, you had no problem. But you fell in love with the city. Yeah, I fell in love with mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I fell in love. I'm saying, what do I fell in love with it? It was black orientated. I I knew everybody. You know, everybody loved the mail, man. And plus, I had a welfare route. <laughs> what's what's, what's the okay. well, wait 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 wait? What's the welfare route? Yeah. You got two kinds of routes in the post office. You got the route the route with rich people. They get this kind of mail. Welfare route. They don't get a lot of mail. They they work. They, there's two days they wait for the first and fifteenth. <laughs> And we call it Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Right. <laughs> Damn. We have fair checks. Yep. We have fair. You know when, when, when Mother's Day come, they be in the parking lot at the post office waiting for you. <laughs> so I said to myself, let me put it into this shit. I, I told all, all I had 400, 470 stops on my route. I said, I tell you what, 
This is my first block that I carry, Ball Ford and Chandler Park. Y'all meet me, all the people people get checks. Meet me on Ball Ford and Chandler Park. I'm gonna get all y'all, I'm gonna give everybody a damn check. Yeah. But you bring me back five dollars when you go pay that the May Rails for all the stuff you ain't got on credit. <laughs> you ain't got the May Rails was selling cigarettes, yeah. they take a pack of cigarettes and sell them 25 cents a piece. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. You, you okay? Yeah. After you go you go pay, pay, pay uh, what's his name? Uh, Abdul or whoever his name is. <laughs> Abdul Mohammed. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> bring me five bu- bucks back. So that money kept me going. Until I got paid, because in the post office, you get paid every two weeks, right? Mm-hmm. But at welfare route, your mail's like this. Because they don't get no damn bills. Yeah. And, yeah. When you, and when you look at your paycheck every time you get paid, you you paying them to jump in your ass if you <laughs> if you don't give them a they check on time. Right. Yeah. Real, I'm serious. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they're taking down your check. Hey, it was a service. They're, yeah. they're, they're getting it, instead of getting it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they're getting yeah. it the first round. And it goes no, no, back. I had to meet me, meet me, meet me on, 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 on my first block to get them all out of the way. And once I get them out of the way, then I can carry my route in peace. Yeah. <laughs> then you got the guys who work for the big three, because when I first moved to Detroit, you got Chrysler, Ford, and GM. Mm-hmm. And I lived not too far from, from when they made the Jeeps and the Dodge truck set. They made all them on the east side, Okay. So back, I will give you another example about Detroit that, that really pissed me off. I bought a, a nineteen eighty five Toyota Supra. Okay, laid out with the, the shed on the back and boot went well. And my cousin, they worked at Ford, and back then the uh, uh, Ford was laying off people because the, the, foreign, the foreigners was was taking over the, over the, over the cars because they was making better cars. Right. And one thing they told me in Detroit. When I first got to Detroit, don't ever buy a car that was built on Saturdays and Sundays. That's why, because everybody's drunk. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm dead serious. Yeah. They yeah, said, yeah, everybody's drunk. Don't buy a car that was made in the weekend. Mm-hmm. Okay. Remember the American cars, how you fall apart? Yeah. Foreign quick. cars didn't. I'm dead serious. This is real talk. This is history of what happened in the market in America, yeah. the right. car market. Do not buy a car that was made in the weekend because they was drunk. Okay. Because it was liquor store right down the street. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So. I drive, I drive down to Milan, Michigan. These are my dad's people, right? I just told them a long time. They all they live in Barron Springs, Benton Harbor. And I drive down. They invite me to the family reunion. I ain't told them in years. I drive down there in my super. And I almost had I almost had a fight. Drive down in my car, and everybody started looking at me like this. I said, why everybody looking at me? I thought this would be glad to see me. Man, you driving a goddamn Japanese car. That's oh, why we, and in, that, in Detroit. That's why yeah. we lost our damn job. Who I mean, I mean, some guys have been buying foreign cars. They worked at the plant. They parked the car in, <laughs> inside that parking lot. It was trash when they got when they came outside. Oh shit. I'm dead serious. That's how Detroit was. Right. I'm trying to figure out what the hell y'all talking about. This is my damn money. I'm gonna spend my money the way I want to. Man, you might have take your black ass back to Detroit. <laughs> I got in my car and left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. No, no, they was this man. They was pissed off they with were me. Serious, yeah. yes. But see, I didn't understand. I'm, I mean, I'm from LA, man. You know, LA, you drive all get foreign cars. What's the thing back in LA? Yeah, nobody yeah. cared. They, they get, they went off on me, man, because of manufacturing yeah. over there. It, because they was losing their jobs mm-hmm. because the foreign cars were taking over. But aside yeah. from, aside from like the drug issues and all that, Detroit had a big middle class back there. Had a huge uh, home ownership by by African Americans. It was it was a lot of middle class people in Detroit because of the car manufacturing. No, well, you had out of drive, you had Sherwood Forest, you had uh, <coughs> you had Green Acres, right? So that being said, the first house I bought in Detroit was on the east side, Hughes basement. Two bedrooms in the middle level. They got they call them bungalows. The whole upstairs was mine. My whole upstairs, no offense, was big as your whole house. That was just your bedroom. That's my bedroom upstairs, right? Man. So I I, I bought the house in the 87 for, for 29.5. And I paid cash for it. And the thing and the thing about it, everybody I was working with that was born and raised in Detroit, that I worked with this man, you live in, on White Hill? Now look at that, that's homeboy. Man, that's a yeah, you pay a lot of money for that for that house, man. I was twenty nine thousand five hundred dollars is not even a payment in L.A. Yeah. What are y'all What are y'all talking about? Yeah, I didn't understand it. You know what I'm saying? But everything was cheap. So what I did, what I did, you know, I've always been to real estate. I made my first investment in Inglewood. They had about thirty five thousand houses, empty, empty, empty houses in Detroit. My first move there, Coleman Young, he was the mayor. He was trying to say, okay, they were selling hood houses. If you know anything about hoods, man, they they dirt cheap. I was buying houses five ten thousand dollars a pop. I bought almost three houses my ten years I lived in Detroit, and what, what and they they would come out in the newspaper on Fridays, Saturdays you got them bid on. Mm-hmm. I had a guy on my route named Johnny Ray. He was born and raised in Detroit, young kid. He had all kinds of property. He said, "Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you the game on how to bid." You know, it was always some old heads out there that's greedy. Got yeah. I knew some guys had a close hundred houses in Detroit. Oh, these old cats. 
They knew how to bid on them. So once I learned how to bid, I was buying houses five, ten thousand dollars a pop. Go downtown, the government would give me money for electricity, the roof, and plumbing. Once I got that done, I had a handyman to, to go paint it. I would rent them out for two or three years. Okay, get my money back. Then I was selling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was flipping houses. Right. It was a piece of cake for me. So I, I made a lot of money in Detroit. So you were hustling wow. all the time. Oh yeah, I'm, 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 I'm still hustling. <laughs> Mm. That's what I'm talking right, about. Right, right. Huh? Mm. Now, did uh, did uh, Snoop ever live in Detroit with you? Yep, Snoop came to Detroit in 1987. This um, let, let me run this by this side. His music career started out. Uh, shit, he was, okay. His his mom was having problems out of him. She used to whip his ass a lot because <laughs> he was he lied a lot. And she called him to him and said he's selling crack. Now Snoop, we selling crack. He said, "Yeah, I said be careful. I'm selling dope down." <laughs> <laughs> So what am I, what am I gonna say? You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, you're doing the same thing. Well, I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, be careful. I just, I just, I just oh, be, be careful, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just keeping it real, man. So she sent him to Detroit. So I was training carriers then, and they had, they had a McDonald's about five blocks from my job. I was kicking it with the manager, Deborah. The, the guy Stu, he owned, he owned the McDonald's. I said, I just said, Stu, I said, my son coming up here for the summer. I don't want him laying around. He gave him a job at McDonald's. He said, yeah, he says, bring out anything you want. Yeah. So I told Stu, I said, when you get here, I got a job for you. He had never had a job before. Mm-hmm. I mean, Stu grew up with 21 insane, rolling 20s, gangbanging. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't yeah. used to being around, he was just being around California guys. Mm-hmm. But I knew once you got to Detroit, you're going to be around hard. You're going to be around Change. Some big change, 360. Yeah. You come to Detroit, you get to, he gets there that night. The next morning, I drop him off at 4.30 at McDonald's. I ain't give him time to get no damn sleep. <laughs> Oh, he ever did slept all day long. Yeah. And then hung with the homeboys. I said, I'm gonna get him away from this shit. He's 15 years old, right? Mm-hmm. So, get him his first job. And about two or three, three weeks later, every time I would go pick him up, everybody was saying, your son is a hell of a rapper. But me and my brothers had a gospel group. I just left him. Yeah. Because I wasn't making no money. But I'm in, in Detroit, in Motown, where everything started from. Yes. The temptation, yes. The yes. poor times, yes. wham, wham. Yes. I had been to the yes. museum and stuff. Damn. They call it the Snake Pit, where they recorded that. Yep. A house on, on Grand Boulevard. I wasn't thinking about no damn rap, man. Mm-hmm. So that being said, one day, i never forget, I was going fishing, and Snoop was rapping. I was Snoop, I had a long day. I don't feel like hearing that shit. <laughs> no, not really. And, and this is what he told me. Y'all ready for this? You ready for this? Yeah, yeah. This is what he told me. He said, Pops, at 15 years old, he said, one day, Pops, the whole world's going to know who the fuck I am. That's right. At 15 oh, years old. Yeah. He said that at 15, I tell everybody that. Mm-hmm. I laughed at it because it was yeah. the way he said it. <laughs> so when he leave and go back to Long Beach, he graduated in 89. I go out to graduation. I just want to be Warren G. Nate, though. But mm-hmm. they was a year ahead of him. Yes. And his mom said, hey, this is Warren G. This is stupid best friend is Nate, though. Okay, I met the guys, right? 88, 89. Mm-hmm. So uh, 90, see, 90, uh, 90, Snoop goes to jail. He got the wayside. Yes, he yes, had sold, yes, sold, sold some crack to an undercover cop. Oh, damn. And this is going to lead into his, the first, his first song. Yes. You go to jail, and then 91, he called me, say, Pops, he said, I'm with this rap group called Above Law. I had heard him, but I, would, I wasn't off the rap. Yeah. I was okay. I said, Well, I wish you the best of luck. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do my last seven years so I can retire. About a week and a half later, he said, Pops, I'm with Dr. Dre. I didn't know who Dr. Dre was, but mm-hmm. some of the younger guys that was 13, 14 years older than yeah, me at the post office. Tommy, Tommy Davis, my dear friend, he retired too. He came, he walked, he lived walking distance from my house on the east side. He came to my house one night. He brought me the album, NWA. I said, what that means? He said, niggas with attitude. I said, I'm, 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 I don't know shit about rap. Yeah. He said, man, if your son with Dr. Dre, he's he finna become a millionaire. I said, yeah, right. Okay. I didn't know who Dr. Dre was. Mm-hmm. So, 91, November, he calls me, say, Papa, I just wrote my first song for Dr. Dre. And what happened was, Warren G had been telling Dre about Stu all along because they know his stepbrothers, right? Yes, yes. And Dre's man, I got time to fuck that little, that little nigga, man. I almost want to hear him. So Dre gave a party one night, and Warren G slipped the CD in. And they played his Snoop song all night long. And Dre said, who's that little nigga? He said, hey, Warren G said, that's, that's what I've been telling you about. Mm-hmm. Dre called him the next day and said, hey, man, you want to you make records? He called Snoop. Snoop thought he said, hey, who's this Dr. Dre? Man, you ain't Dr. Dre. <laughs> you want to make records? <laughs> right, and, right. And... He clicked. He said, yeah, I want to make records. So he made, the, okay, he wrote his first song. He called me and said, hey, Pops, I wrote, wrote my first song, Deep Cover, in an hour and 45 minutes. I'm still living in Detroit, right? Yes. He said, the movie comes. He said, I wrote for a soundtrack, Deep Cover. The movie was Lawrence Fitzburne. Mm-hmm. Remember the mm-hmm. 90, right. 91? Yes. yes, sir. So what happened was he called me. The movie came out January the 21st, 1992. 
He's supposed to go see the movie. So a bunch of young guys went to, went to Eastland Mall to me, with me to the movie, right? He watched night and they played the song. After the movie was over, I said, his time pretty good. But what caught people's attention was one that 187 on an undercover cop. Mm-hmm. And then creep with me as I crawled through the hood, mainly act, lunatic, call him stupid, he's wood. Uh-huh. And I'm listening to his shots. I said, he's time pretty damn good, right? So in in March, Stu called me and said, man, Shook and Dre want to meet you. They want to know where I got my musical talents from. He was going to fly you out here, right? So he fl- he fly me out there, right? And I'm all dressed up. I'm thinking I'm going to be in limousine because I know you're going to sold a lot of records. <laughs> So he had got in jail by then. It was him, my nephew, Dad. You know, Dad's yes, from Dog yeah, Pound. Yes. That's my that's my nephew, and and and, and half did. They had their report waiting on me. So Subek got tall by then. He was up about six three, six four. So when I get my luggage and stuff, I'm thinking I'm I'm riding a limousine. Now I walk outside. They got an old seven eight blue <laughs> Monte Carlo, full of McDonald bags and and Popeye chicken bags that I left to start a recycling company. <laughs> and <laughs> and, 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 and Stu say, Pop, you got ten dollars. I have ten dollars for what? We need some gas. I just got to hit record out, man. Uh, if you got to hit, you got to hit record. Right? I'm kids, serious, man. Kids, I tell you. Uh, if you got to hit record out, he's a if, if you got ten dollars, we can make it back back to my apartment. Yeah. All right, money. Put some gas in the car. I drove, folks. He lived. He lived on on, on Whitley and Franklin in Hollywood, mm-hmm. off, off Sunset. Yes. On the corner, his apartment there was at, it was a big dip in the back. A lot of people just hear the car, bam, you know what I'm saying? I go, walk inside his apartment, I see all these drug addicts outside. Man, what kind of shit is this? Go inside his apartment, he was living with the DOC, mm-hmm. the doc. Yes. The doc had lost his voice because he had the car accident. I, first time beating doc. This is 92. Go to Stu's uh, kitchen. He, he had a sound on his refrigerator saying, if you didn't bring shit, don't fuck with shit. <laughs> <laughs> but when I, but when, I, when, I, good. when I opened the door, one shit in there. <laughs> So I was okay, let me go buy you some groceries, right? Yeah. So this is the first incident with Shug. They was they was using they was on at Solar Records on 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 Kahunga. Dick Rivet. Okay. He had let them run out, run out the sixth floor. So this is my first time meeting Dr. Trey. We go down there, it was walking distance, right? Shug got everybody raged and everybody within walking distance. Walk down there, go inside the studio, sixth floor. Walk upstairs. You no, know, by me living in Detroit, I wasn't used to seeing a whole bunch of guys. About 25, 30 guys in the studio. Pants hanging off their ass and shit. All gang bankers and shit. It didn't bother me. I'm a Vietnam vet. I don't give a shit about these clowns, man. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I see Dr. Dre sitting over there, and some told me that's Dr. Dre. I, I introduced myself. So he making, they working on the chronic. So, so I'm asking, this is 92. I'm asking, yeah. I'm asking Dre. I'm asking Dre, is, is anybody going to buy this shit? Dre said, man, we going platinum. I didn't know what platinum was because mm-hmm. back in my day it was, it was gold records. Yes. I know what platinum was, right? So they were working on that. I stayed out there for about two weeks. The second day, we supposed to be going to the studio. Dre pulls up at Stoop's apartment on William Franklin. He had two guys with him, two big guys. He was driving a gray BMW 75th album. It was an old ass car, right? <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize he was doing that bad, right? So this is my, this is my second time being around Dre. He told Suge, we're not going to, to the studio today. Some shit went down last night with Suge. He shot. He shot up, got into some guy and shot up mm-hmm. in the cellar. Okay. So, so I had met Suge then, but I, I finally met Suge. Suge didn't have shit. Dre didn't have shit, right? So I stayed there for I stayed there for two weeks, went back to Detroit. And they still working on the chronic. I think around the summertime I'm driving to work one morning. I hear it one, two, three, until the four. Okay, it was dark. That's the damn that's time pretty good. It was Stoop and Dre. Yeah. Them but a G thing. Yes. That that record got them to where they are right now. Mm-hmm. And I get to the post office, man, you hear that song? Your song just made, woo, 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 woo. Here come the haters in the post office. Oh, of course. Here they come, okay. Now they had haters even back then. Right, right. right. Yeah, there's a fight so, a few. So Dre brought me back out to LA, and, and that's when they, they, uh, did, they uh, did, he did Let Me Ride first. He put me in that video. And they got from that mother G thing. So I, I got interested in film. So the album took off. Stoop them came out to Detroit on a promotional tour. They had a club called Club International. Uh, Cuba just left there, right? And during that time, Kid Rock, Kid Rock, he was big. You know Kid Rock? Yes, yes. He from Michigan. This is for Eminem. Then I started hearing rumors at the post. I was, man, he got this white guy named Eminem. Live across Eight Mile Road. He got a hell of a rap move. Went well. So when Stupin came to, to Detroit, I went downtown. It's right next to the bus station. And we was going, we was going to our... <coughs> We was going to Club International, right? Down in Mexican. We got a place in, in, in Detroit called Mexican Village, all Latinos, right? 
He's in that area. So we went out to the club, and they started performing, right? They started throwing these throwing glad throwing, throwing glasses at Stoop and Dre. They blocked them. They were still rapping. They blocked them. those those thick rim glasses. Mm-hmm. And they threw one on the floor and hit me on my damn mic. And I went down to I went down to the floor, right? Got through that shit, and that's when I began to realize that the rap game wasn't like R and B. We had a hotel room. Sugar got blocked off the whole floor. So here come the groupies. That's the first time I ever seen the groupie. I heard about them. Yeah. This is first, now I'm seeing groupies, right? So once he, the floor got full of women, Suge had his bodyguards. Don't let anybody in, right? So Stoop and them they had a babe and stuff. And this way he got married, right? And some guys was downstairs say, man, tell Dre stupid. They got a woman. We're going to call some homeboys up to to, to, to to fuck them up, right? But the cats I would, I work with from the east side, they, they said, well, we have to call our guys to fuck y'all up first. Because <laughs> this is how Detroit is, right? Yes. So we, we kind of squashed that. And from that point on, man, then the next time, this is a, this a 92, next time, Suge them was on the promotion of the tour, and what happened was they was in Milwaukee, and Suge had some of his homeboys beat up the limousine drivers, and they took the limousines. Back then, new supporters called me, man. You, we went where I'm. I supposed to be going on tour, had my clothes packed. Stupid went back to LA. I'm, I'm, I'm asking, like, what's going on, man? This is where I really got deep into the rap game, right? Right. I said, what's going on? He said, hey, man, Suge did this, did, did this, and did that. So that being said, 90, uh, 93, I go back out there and shoot a video, and there's a soup called his murder case, right? So from I told Shoes why I have to move them out of the neighborhood of Ben Way, I said, because there's some drama going on, and these uh I was a, a, a gang up there called you buy yourself hustlers. And they was messing with soup them. I'm telling uh, Shoes wife, Sharita, because she was their manager back then, get them out of this neighborhood. She wouldn't do it. I'm at that for I, I leave Detroit and I had a bad feeling something was gonna happen. You no, know, you're a father, man. You kinda yeah, feel me. You, feel that. Right. You, know, you got kids, you kinda mm-hmm. feel that shit. You no, know, it's yes, intuition. Sir. Am I right or wrong? Yes, you're sir. Right. right. Mm-hmm. So about one thirty my cousin called me. She said, You heard about Stoop now? I just heard about what? It was a murder case. Man. And I'm thinking, well, you probably you probably bullshit. And then my niece called me. Then my other niece called me. I knew right then something was wrong. So I called Suge's wife. And asked what was going on. She wouldn't tell me shit. So I called her back. I'm pissed off now. I'm wide awake. I got the call in sick. And she finally told me what happened. And uh, I saw her seeing Stu's picture, murder case and stuff. What really get, what pissed me off was they put him on Time Magazine with a uh, skull cap on saying number one with a bullet. You know, quite naturally, my coworkers started talking shit. Okay, your son, I came to the people who you came to this business. He you know, jacked his career off. No, I didn't think none of it, man. Right? You know what I'm saying? So. I saw her going back and forth to court with him. Then. When was the first time after he caught that murder, when was the first time you actually spoke to him? Now, I spoke to him right after that. We got in jail because the bodyguard. And what was that conversation like? I asked him what, I, I never asked him what happened. I, I asked him, was you all right? I'm not the type father going to ask him what happened, man. Right. I didn't want to go off in detail. It was worse enough him being in trouble. Yeah. You so were supporting him. Right, right. So why I add fuel to the fire? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. But I know Malik was in jail and, and shook Bill's, Bill, Bill Stoop out and uh, a million dollars and and at the I, I think he had he, he put up hundred thousand dollars ten percent of that right. right. Yeah. Here come out here come now here come my family members. Oh, Stoop got hundred thousand dollars. I'm trying to figure why the fuck everybody worried about Stoop. That's my damn son. That's yeah. his business. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying I'm not worried about your kids. Yep. Right. So why right, no everybody they whole, everybody's focus was on Stoop as as I speak today. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, Suge prolonged the trial for about two and a half years. Okay. So, Snoop them. They really weren't doing no shows back then. No, it was I began this uh this guy named DJ Black, they called him Kevin Black. He called me one day, he said, Man, your son finna be the biggest rapper in the world. It's still hit me, okay? Mm-hmm. I don't know shit about rap. He's he finna change the whole phase of rap. It still didn't hit me, okay? And he said, uh, but you just come out here and see what's going on with Death Row. So I went back out there again and Shug had all all Death Row officers, they was on Worcester Boulevard. He was on Worcester. And and West Wood Boulevard, right down from UCLA. <laughs> he had bloods on one side, he had Crips on the other side. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, I couldn't tell the difference. I've seen guys walking back and forth. I didn't know shit about gang banging, but I really didn't give a shit about none of them, really. I'm a Vietnam vet, okay? Bring it. I don't give a <laughs> shit. I, I mean, I'm, 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 you've been in the shit. I've been, yeah. around, I've been around the baddest motherfucker in the goddamn world. I'm a deal. You think you, that you don't mean shit to me? <laughs> that, that's how I feel. Yeah, I get that. Okay? Sure. So, so that, uh, I seen what was happening and stuff, man. 
And I know the student was always had the head down and went around. Well. And one day I was, I was at Super Super Department. It was me and him, a big C style, all the homies. And Super said, "Pops, you got more money than anybody in this building." I said, "What you mean? This half yet? That's this half the chronic. Yeah. I'm the one having. Oh, they're selling millions of records on the crank." I said, "What do you mean, he said, man?" He said, "Man, he said we handcuffed and we're going to leave death row, but we can't." I said, "God damn, man! I say nothing I can do for you, so I'm still working at the post office." So when his child saw it in 95, that's why I took early retirement. I had to be there for him because I was seeing him on TV with his pants sagging and shit. If I call him one day, I have to slip here's the deal. Give me your suit size. Send me $1,000. Let me go get you about eight, nine suits. I've called Ted Bundy was a serial killer. He wore a suit. Mm-hmm. I've, you look like a right. You look like a hula. Yeah. I've, let me dress you up. So, you know, Stoop is tall, 6'5". You look good in a suit. So that's changed his whole persona. Mm-hmm. So I retired. I had suits every day. So I, I was going to, you see his clippings, you see me every, at the courthouse suit every single day. From December That's up, right. up until April. You see me? I was with him every day. Okay? That's Supporting. Right. Okay? But a lot of people don't realize, but I, I sacrificed seven years of my of my life taking early retirement from the post. I lost money behind that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't give a shit. I said, I said to yeah, myself, your if you're going to go down, I'm going down with you. Okay? But I, I had a backup plan. I had five houses in Detroit that was paid for so I had an income. Mm-hmm. I could always go back to Detroit and, and, and show up my landscaping business because I grew up in landscaping. That wasn't a problem. So he finally got acquitted. And uh, when he got acquitted, man, uh, he was still doing crazy shit. How, still how, did, how did that? How, let's, let's, let's roll back a mm. little bit. When, before the verdict, how were you feeling? Was there any time that you thought, man, maybe I'm about to lose my son to the, you know, to the prison system or anything like that? One day, i never forget the courtroom on 3rd and Hill. Uh, we, no, all, all, all murder trials was on the ninth floor. Mm-hmm. And let me take it back to what Suge was doing. She, at first, me and Stu started riding to, uh, to the uh, courthouse in Lincoln. Went from Lincoln to a Rolls Royce. Not knowing that Suge was, t- was charging my son all along for all that shit. Wow. Then he went and got a motor home. You ready mm-hmm. for this shit? Where, during lunch break, we go in the motor home and chill. You know? And every time, we pull, every time we pull inside the parking lot on 13th Hill, all the workers wish, wish my son the best. Cameraman filmed us from the time we got out in the car until we got into the courtroom. It was just total chaos. Circus. Damn. Johnny Crockin posted that stupid first. Johnny Crockin told me, he said, man, I can't, I can't represent your son. He's going to give him a David Kenner, and I'm going to give Sean. I'm going to take Sean. He's got every white person in the world want to kill me because I won OJ case. Mm-hmm. I never forget right. what Johnny Crockin right. told me. Yep. He's the every, person, every white person in the world want to kill me. He said, he said, I can't take your son. So that's when David Kenner got to. Around about the, a month and a half into the trial, David Kenner and Shug, we was in the parking lot one day, and they guaranteed me, said, man, your son's not going to prison. I, said, I mean, that's my first time I've been in the courtroom. I've seen how, how, how the judge play one another, the, the uh, DAs and stuff. They go to the family, the victims first, and make it sound, and they get to crying and shit, and then yep. they, they want the, the, the court to sympathize with him. Then they, they come to Snoop, and they, they make shit sound so all out yep. of whack, right? So I'm, now I'm in, I'm, I'm in this shit. I'm looking at this shit, man. I know uh, Ed Nissen, he wanted my son so bad he could taste it. Okay. So what happened was, man, we got through all this bullshit and it gets to the verdict. We had dad's house up in Silver Lake. And we finally got the phone call. So they, they came to a verdict. Go back to the courthouse and they and they, they got acquitted. And, and it, yeah. it was a silent relief, okay? Yep. But stupid still doing a lot of shit I didn't like. I told my son, boy. I'm at your house in Claremont by myself, 5,000 square foot, off Monte Vista. You stand on Wilson Boulevard, you're in Park. Because Park came to death row in 95, December. Yes. Park lived across the street from, across all from Sue. I'm out here by my damn self. I'm looking at the cameras every night, but I'm knowing I'm being watched by cops. I'm knowing I'm being watched. One night, some of his homeboys came out and broke his headlights out of his car. I got all these pit bulls with me. I'm not a dog lover, I'm an ex male man. Dogs chase me every <laughs> goddamn day. <laughs> Okay, I mean, I'm going to deal with this pit bull. Oh, no. Nah. Okay, okay. Then they had dog face all the time, okay? And what happened was, man, uh, he finally moved me from Claremont into uh, to, to, to Luke Lake on, on Mopar. Right up the street. Hmm? I, I feel kind of half-ass safe there, right? But I noticed that, think about it, I left my job. I'm making six, five, or $7,000 a year. Now I ain't making shit. Cause Stoop didn't really tell me the real that that Shug wasn't really paying them shit. So a lot of shit was going down then. So one day Daz, 
he had bought, he, okay, Monsieur, when Sue won, won his birthday case, Sue got him a Rolls Royce. He got a pocket Rolls Royce. He was going to deal with Hammer, but I guess he found out Hammer was in, in so deep of debt, he left him alone. I think the, the, the uh, uh, yeah, he left Hammer alone, but what happened was, man, the way the pot came in the picture, Stoop and Dad said had devil pocket before, right? And I was right there at Can Am Studio when, when Pac was in jail. Wouldn't nobody get him out. Yeah, I think he had been in jail for almost a year. He was catching yeah, pure hell in right. jail. Yeah. And Suge said, he said, I want to I want to get a vote on who want me and David Kennedy to go up to New York and get get Pac out in jail. Stupid dad said, man, get him out, man. So he he up there right in with us. Cause they knew him, right? Mm-hmm. So they they they're the ones who brought Pac to death row not knowing all the shit was gonna happen the next year, right? Yeah. So for Pac, he was in trouble. And what happened was a lot of people realized. Park, he was he was he was, he, was, he got shot out with Interscope. He was a star before he came to Death Row. Let's face fact. Mm-hmm. Yes, he just yeah. got locked up in jail. So, so he was with with uh, Jimmy Iovine them at Def, at Interscope. So when Suge got him, Interscope was giving Death Row distribution. So it was like a that's a, that's a changeover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. He, he was called the Timber Drummer for what's the name for he been right there with Death Row. Uh, Park was type cat that. Yep, yep, yep. He's always talking. But you, you see him on TV, that's the way he was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was real tight with Pac. I don't think Pac, I don't think those rappers had, didn't have back in the day that Stupid had Stupid had me. So I was everybody's dead here. Mm-hmm. You feel me? I've been with them cats 30 some years, right? And I try to lead them in the right direction. But Stupid have always had me. So that being said, Dad's called me one day. He said, Pop, I'm going to come out and pick you up. I'm going to take you up to Death Row Records because Dad moved up there on, on, a, on a Worcester Boulevard in San Vicente. Mm-hmm. He was sure going to talk all his Stoops cars, Nate Dogg's cars, and Rage's car. I know the Stoops looking off damn sad, right? I, when I got to Claremont. I go up there, they took the cars and stuff, shot paying them and everything. Rage was standing with Stoop. And I'm trying to ask Stoop, what's going on? And so I tell him the story, right? He, he's about ready to lose everything. I never forget. I met I met Master P at Washington. I saw him at Roscoe sticking a waffle with Daz. You know, back then rappers was kind of hating on one of them. Give a little nod and keep walking and shit. <laughs> so I'm asking Daz, who was this man? That's Master P. Okay, so I'm I'm uh, stupid. Had a little had a, a little gazebo in his backyard. My dad cleaned up one day. I get a phone call. And yeah, I'm, and today I don't know how Master P got my number. But he called me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nah, 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 yeah, nah. yeah. Uh, I was, I was like, who the hell is this, man? This Master P. <laughs> I'm sorry, who the hell is this? Master he's, he's, he's just Master P, man. Bring your boy down. He's bring your boy down to no limits. He's like, I know where you're from, pops. Come to find out, my cousin worked for him that I'd never met before, right? I grew up 45 minutes from New Orleans. I know where P came from. The, the Calapos projects and Cash Money, Money Boys, right down the street to Magnolia's, right? So he bring you born and for I, when Stoop got on my Stoop, I said, "Cause wouldn't nobody go? Didn't nobody want to fool with Stoop? Cause of that death row shit." I got Stoop on his first big tour, a lot of blues. I was at the William Morris on Gregory, Gregory and Wilson, and now Wilson Boulevard. Me and Bill White, his manager, all day long trying to convince them to put Stoop on his tour. This is the first tour, big tour he ever went on. Lollapalooza, mm-hmm. ninety-seven, yes. forty-five cities, two and a half months. Got him on that. So, so I I, I, I told Stoop, I Stoop man. Go down with Master P. I'm saying, I said, because at the end of the day, you can put money in your pocket, right? So, 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 how do you speak to your son? I mean, okay, so he's arguing with Tupac. Tupac dies a month later. No, no, let, let and me. And then he goes to he he leaves Death Row, and then he goes to No Limit. Like, how do you support? And what do you say to him to like keep? Because I, I mean, if my best friend died. And then all of a sudden, I got to leave Death Row. I got to leave my record label. And then now I got a, 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 an opportunity to go to another record label. I mean, my mind would be screwed. Well, what I wouldn't ha- know what to think. But what happened was, don't forget, Drake was the first one to leave, to leave Death Row. Mm-hmm. Okay, because when Pac came, came to uh, Death Row, before he came to Death Row, Drake was used to working in a, in a quiet environment, Can-Am yeah. Studios. I, I was in a studio with them every day. But I didn't know what was happening behind closed doors. What my business, right? So when Pac came, Pac started bringing people in. Mm-hmm. You no, know, the outlaws, Doug Live, Dre wasn't used to that shit. Okay, so Stoop called me one day. He said, "Pops, Dre just left that row. I said, you didn't go with him." I got mad. He said, yeah. "Pops, I can't go with him. He's on handcuffed." I said, well, "Where's your being handcuffed? We can't, leave, we can't leave that row." In the contract, mm-hmm. right? So what happened was when Pop got killed and Shug went to jail, they gave him out. So mass people went up there and did, him and Shug chopped up. I don't know what happened. Don't know. What, don't want to know what happened. Yeah, he went up there and, and, and Stoop gave. He went from Stoop Dog to Dog to Stoop Dog. Sugar wanted this, he wanted that. So that's how all this shit came about. 
So I had this singer from Colton out by Riverside. He was going to sign up, right? So so me and Stu went to a video. This, this P was filmed up there at Legion, at Legion Park where he mm-hmm. trained cops at. So that's, that's when I really got I met P. And he flew me, Snoop, Daz, Chun Dog down to Baton Rouge. Because that was the first day when he was stopped in Houston. He had a show at the summit. No Limit Soldiers. Place was packed. But I can tell Snoop wasn't happy. Mm-hmm. But he, and his music story changed because he didn't have Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is the only person I ever say that can bring the best out of my son. Because Dre, he didn't care who he was. He go, he keep it in the studio all day long, two or three days. Until you get it right. Until the right. But he got with, with P, it mm-hmm. was like he had Beast by the Pound, Moby Dick, and, and this guy, guy named Fing. But the first time I noticed about P, how, how he ran his company, he get down to Baton Rouge, right? He gave me a, a sheet on what I could do and what I couldn't do. And Death Row, you can be in the studio with, with the artist, you can do this, do that. Everything thing went. Mm-hmm. And when we was at Can Am Studio, the first time I went to Can Am, it was me, Nate Dog, Daz, and Stephen. Everybody started pulling out guns. I seen sandbags up against the windows. I'm trying to say, this got them Vietnam away. <laughs> it was just on, on Reseda and Arkansas Boulevard. Mm-hmm. They had to make a left, it was backed up in the, in the cut, right? So, Nate Dog pulled out a, a Magnum 44, biggest dirty Harry. I said, God damn. <laughs> and Stoops A Pops is better to be caught with him than to be caught without him. I'm trying to figure what the hell's going on. So that's the first thing I noticed. When I, when I got down to Master P, there was no violence. No, when he said no limit soldiers, he had them just like soldiers. He said, hey, Pop, you can't be in the studio with your son. You can't do this. You can't do that. I have to respect that. I mean, now I'm, I'm beginning to see the difference between Shug and P. And then I seen people's business, man. He had bought the governor's mansion in Baton Rouge. He had bought all, all his artists' houses. Governor's mansion. In, inside of the golf course. The white people didn't like it at first. <laughs> But when you when start buying, buying land and, and building stuff for the kids, they love him. Okay. So I began to see, okay, he's your businessman. But I know where he came from. God, my cub, my dad, all my dad's people came from New Orleans. And they, they lived in projects called New Orleans, but there were projects before Katrina. Well, I was out in New Orleans all the time. I, this place, to be honest, no offense against New Orleans. I know, I've never liked New Orleans. That place always gave me the creeps. They always talk about voodoo and <laughs> graves on top of the ground because it's, it's below sea yeah, level. Right. Around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he get down there. He gave him thirty five thousand dollars sign up bonus. He was there for three years, right? I would fly back and forth. My hometown was like long, only forty five minutes away. So Stoop got a chance to meet his great grandmother and everybody. I, I made sure he met his people. To me, that's important mm-hmm. to know your folks. Yes. My mom and everybody on the weekends, <coughs> we come back up to Mississippi and hang out with them and stuff. And uh. I can tell Stoop wasn't happy, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he didn't have that good smoke down there. They down there, so he spoke. Y'all, you guys spoke in blunt side. They spoke in backwoods down there. You know, we took we tear our backwood up. It's like putting the puzzles back together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it really is. So anyway, uh, he's missing L.A. and the whole lifestyle. You think? Who? He, oh, he was, he was missing the bad. He has Chante down there with him. So Pia bought him a house. So what happened was, man. That's why I came up with the West Side Riders, which is coming out next uh, next yeah, week on the twenty sixth. Yeah. So he fought his uncle St. Charles. He was the one who gave him my, my, my record deal. Come to find out, he had gave Drew, a piece for his record deal on Ice Cream Man. Bayside oh, Distribution in Sacramento. So I had stupid my album, and it's still on my album, right? And he gave him the green light. They popped, you can use my son, dad's. They all the same guys. They all said, you can have a song. They kept it publishing, right? So, so uh, people was coming back from overseas with Snoop. He had gave me my girl $15,000. And he forgot about us because now you guys too. Okay, I, I, I begin to see, no offense against P, I begin to see the writing on the wall. So I saw him in Detroit. I think it was Cobra Hall. He tell me, hey, Pops, you know I can sue you. I will sue you for what? Because you got your son on the album. I said, I can sue, I, I'm going to counter sue you. He said, what? Because you brought me down there with my girls and said you was going to sign up, give him $15,000. You forgot about us because all you wanted was Snoop. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just kept it real, man. Yeah. I mean, you, go, you go right there. But he didn't know. He couldn't sue me no way. Alfonso Garcia was the one put the put up the five hundred thousand dollars for, for all, put up all the money. That was his money. West Side Riders. Yeah, West Side Riders, right? He disappeared. Okay, okay. Six Four Joe was the one called me nine months ago. That's how I hooked up with Gold Toast. Say, now, man. Now West Side Riders. Who was on that actual? It was a CD back then, right? Eighteen songs. I, I had half guys from the Bay, half guys from from from, man, from, from that's from historic South right there. Right, eighteen songs, man. But but they were all they were on CD back then. On a, on a CD back then, and 
They all platinum artists. They're all platinum. And what they, what they all did, he is he's. I did my research. He sold like about five million copies over Amazon. Okay, and but the album never was put out there to where the, to the, the public. Right, but right. by me putting it back out next week, now the public gonna get a chance to hear it. Mm-hmm. I'm dropping Snoop first. I'm dropping Dad second. I'm dropping JT the bigger figure. I'm going down the line like that. That's yeah. that's, that's the names you got in there. Go to sitting right here. You gave me a, a nice distribution deal. See what I did. See back then I, I didn't know nothing about the game. Now it's been 23 years. I've been in the game going on 34 years. I know the game now. Yes. I know I know distribution is key and bring the right shit. Right, bring the right music. I got mm-hmm. the bomb. I got a nuclear bomb that album. The West Side Riders. Trust me. And now they're doing digital and streaming and all this kind of stuff. You know, back then they had street teams and you had to go to the record store, everybody wants to see you and stuff. I sold a whole lot of records in, in Oakland on 73rd Street in, in East Mount Mall. That, I mean, that album was going like this. But he took the first half, he paid us the first half of our money, the second half he never saw it. Disappeared on you. He disappeared. Now, you know what goes around comes around. Now I got my stuff back, okay? Gold Toast and gave him a distribution deal, so 26, the next weekend. It, it seems to me like the... Like the the music business is just as cutthroat as a dope game, huh? The only way you're gonna learn about the music business, you got to get screwed. You got to get screwed. Yep. Everybody, everybody yeah, I talked to, the first time I heard that. Everybody I talked to from Temptations, everybody been screwed in this mm-hmm. business. Cause you know, when you first come to the music business, everybody's all excited, and they forget it's music. Music first, but it's a business. That's why he calls it music business. The music business. I when I went into drive limousines two years, right? I drove a lot of artists, man, who had had. had uh, Contracts because back then it was seven years statute of limitation to where you stuck for seven, for seven years. I've drove artists, man, to where I, I give you an example Coolio. You know, Coolio is yes, right. Yes, absolutely. Rest remember, in peace. Remember, remember, he had that album out called uh, uh, Gangs Paradise? Yes. He made a lot of money on the album. He told me flat out, I was driving him one night. He's a Papa Snoop. My second album, them Jews in New York did not push my record. He said, I had to go up there and walk to the down floor with the homeboys. My ready to kill everybody up there. He said, What they do, they promote your first album. And once they make a lot of money on you, you don't give a shit about the other two or three albums. And all that resonated towards me. Mm-hmm. And I was like a fly on the wall. You no, know, Snoop had a lot of people kissing his ass, running behind him, just want to hang around him because he was Snoop. Yeah. I'm his daddy. I don't run behind nobody. I don't give a shit. Jesus Christ. I, okay? <laughs> I might wave at you, you dip. Yes. I'm gone. Yes. You feel me? But that being said, I was, t- I was taking notes. Like I told Snoop a couple days ago. I want to thank you. I want to thank Dr. Dre. Warren G. Everybody I've been around. But get, for let me know how the game go. I seen what you guys went through. I'm not going through that bullshit. Right. I was told stupid a long time ago and training him. If I was had, had to be in this business, I'm gonna have to run my own shit. Yeah, I, 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 I seen everybody get screwed. I'm trying to figure out why. I made you millions, but you're not really giving me what I, what I got to do. I'm not. I'm not gonna be that way. My orders are sitting right over there, West, Big West from Texas. That's my first orders. Seth is a West store making millions. I'm gonna pay him before I pay myself. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's something my dad taught me. Pay them first because you might need them again. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And God don't like ugly, man. You sure, when you mess up with people, they got a thing called karma. That's right. And, and karma has no timeline. He hits you when you least suspect it. That part. No, it hits you when you least suspect it. That part. Just that simple. For you, if you treat people, my, my, my dad always tell me, if you stay right, everything will be all right. Mm-hmm. People know me, I stay right. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I ain't never screwed up. I ain't never messed up with nobody, man. It come it, back, come back to bite your ass, man. It's amazing that you, you tell the story of your of your son and Dre because from from an outsider's stance, I would have thought by the time they were doing the chronic that they were balling oh, out, yeah. that they uh-uh. had all this money. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. They were getting screwed all that time. Man, stupid didn't have shit, man. Okay? He didn't have nothing. He didn't tell me about it. I had to find out the hard way. But one thing I do know, when the last album we did, we we, we had Cobo Hall in Detroit. Last song he made for the album he made, he, he made for P was uh, Last Meal. As a father, I knew what that meant. That's your last album. Mm-hmm. I told Stupid Night, cause he, I mean, I can tell you he wasn't happy at all. I'm stupid, look here. You done you made money for sure, you done made money for P. The darker style stuff you were talking about, start your darker style label. Because right. people come to see you, they're not coming to see P. Yeah. They're exactly. not, they not coming to see Suge. Sure. Sure, they come to see you. Yes. Uh, you are, you are, uh, 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 are the star of the show. Yes, sir. And that's what he did. So once once he got that, he found Cashmere Entertainment, Ted Chong. The rest is history. Here we are. Yes, sir. You know man. Your your son is easily one, if not the most known face in rap around the world. He's one of the more rec- recognizable yes. rappers in the world. Yes, how, how did it feel to see Snoop at the Super at the Bowl? Super Bowl, man? Oh man, it brought back a lot of a lot of memories, man. Because like I said, I knew they was going they was going to do nothing but the G thing. But but here's the deal. Let me say this: back in the day when they were shooting videos. 
That wasn't Suge doing that. It was Dr. Dre. Yes. He all the videos. Think about it, when Dr. Dre left Death Row. Them videos wasn't the same. Yeah, that's right. Am I right or wrong? No, you're, no, right. you're right. You're right. Now, when he played the Super Bowl, I was really shocked. I think Jay Z hooked it up for him. I think, if I'm not mistaken. But that was the best Super Bowl show I, I've ever yes, seen. Yes, yes, yes. Hands down. They, they they set the bar so high. Yes, they did. They set the bar so high that right, everybody right. comes behind it now. It's like, eh. Yeah. No, no, no. They, they, they can't duplicate that, man. Because Dr. Drake was Dr. Drake was the one who put it together. Absolutely. Chris, Chris, put the phone number up there real quick. I'm sure some people want to talk to Pops over here. Man, this is just a, a, a walking history right here. Right? Yeah, the, the only thing that hurt with that Super Bowl is all those dancers on the 60, what, 63, 62. Oh, yeah. You have, They're sitting on the hood of these cars. <laughs> right. I'm like, what are they doing? Yeah, man. Like, you got dancers, girls with high heels. Just, just uh, right, right, just right, right. Their hoods. I'm like, right. no. Yep. Yeah, that hurt me. That hurt. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 th- you thought about your car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you ain't feel let them to walk. Hell you, no, nobody gonna walk on my car. Anybody feel walk on my yeah, shit yeah. either? <laughs> <laughs> ain't no way. Oh uh, yeah, but yeah, that, that I mean, the whole video, that whole Super Bowl show, that was man, that was top of the line, yeah. man. So I know yeah, it, t- it I, took you a while. When did you finally realize? Because you, you know, you said you know rap. When did you finally realize? Yeah, my son's a superstar. I'm gonna tell you when I realized that. Ninety six, when I when I retired, when Stuart won his murder case, mm-hmm. we went overseas. This is when I realized how big he was. We in London, right? And they have the BBC called Tops to the Pops. It's like American Bandstand, mm-hmm. Soul Train. Back then, Phil Collins, you know about Phil Collins, yeah. right? Yes. Su, 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 the, yes. He was a star back then, right? Stoop had only been in the game, what, about four years, right? So we go to Tops to the Pops. Because they had, they had two stages. Phil Collins was over here. <coughs> Soup over here, right? We walk in and stuff. So you know like how they have a crowd around you? It's all it's all fake and shit, you know what I'm saying? Cure Young, when Stu walked in, guess what? This is no lie. Before he was got on stage, everybody that was watching Phil Collins ran to Snoop. Left him here and there by himself. I said, damn, I'm knowing I'm knowing second color. I'm knowing Give us a second color. I am knowing who Phil Collins is. That's that's how I begin to but it got worse when worse when I got to uh the Amsterdam in the green light district where you, where you buy a smoke at, right? We walk inside. You, you seen people walking up down the street. You no, know, these little smoke shops. They got strings in them. And when you go walk inside, you got a menu. You can buy this. I seen the Acapulco Gold and Panama Red. I was like, fuck all the rest of the other shit. I want Acapulco Gold and Panama Red because that's why I grew up smoking when I first moved to Cali. The real shit, right? right. We smoke. Get ready to come back to the bus. We didn't see nobody, but a few people walking up down the street. I swear to God, man, less than five minutes, we were surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of kids. <laughs> And we couldn't, the bus couldn't move. That's why I really, I feel stupid. You big over here, then you're overseas. Uh, caller, That's, caller, who's this? Yeah. What's up, Frankie? Talk to us, man. You got you got pops in the building, man. Papa Snoop. What's up, guys? I just want to say big fan of Snoop's, uh, big fan of the show. Uh, Frankie, a.k.a. Spanky the Great. Much love and respect to you guys, and uh, have a blessed night. All right, all right brother. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you want to say, you wanna say all, he's, he Give supports. His, yeah, yeah. So when when is uh, your West Side Riders going to be released, and where can people actually find uh, the music at? Go Toes. That's Go Toes. May, 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 May 26. May 26th? On, on, on all platforms or what? Okay, okay. What do you do? Just type in West Side Riders or what? But now return, return, return to the West, to the West Side, Side Riders. Riders. Right, it, it, it's done. You heard it already? Oh no, it's been out. Yo, it was out. It was out, but it. But, but it didn't get the shine. It didn't get the promotion. It didn't get all that stuff that that it, that it was supposed to get, huh? Let him jump on here real quick, boy. Uh-huh. Let him jump on here real quick. Take your take your beer with you. Take your beer with you. <laughs> all right, let me see. I, I wish we had a bottle of wine opener. Caller, caller, who's this? I do have a bottle opener. Caller, caller, who's this? Talk to us, brother. What's up, Reno, Nevada? Wanted to give you guys a big shout out, man. Been supporting for a while and just proud of all three of you guys there, man. And just want to let Snoop Dad know that, you know, the Hispanics been supporting him for years and will continue to support. That's right. Thank brother. you, Gil, for accepting the call. You guys have a great day. For sure. You too, my man. Yeah. And that's one thing that, that, that I do want to reiterate to you, Pops, that as far as the Rasa, the, man, we love Snoop Dogg, man. Thank Snoop, you. Dogg, Snoop Dogg has been part of our life pretty much since that beginning with the mm. with 91, all that. I remember me personally, I got out of jail, I think it was 92, mm-hmm. no, ni- 93. Mm. I was in jail, 91, 92. I heard a little bit of it. In 93, I get out, and my brother says, listen to this. And the I rock, and this, this, I'm like, whoa. It was, it, was, it was just something new mm-hmm. that had never been heard before. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that. Let me see what yeah. we got to call her. 
Caller, caller, who's this? What's going on, brother? Talk to us. Hey, uh, I just wanted to know uh, where uh, Snoop Dad, where is he from originally? His, his accent says the boo 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 da do boo do. I don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know, Pop. Is that, is that Dallas? Where is that? I said, Eric, country, very country accent. I don't know where, where, where that's from. You didn't catch the beginning of the live, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, let him know, Pops, where are you originally from? I'm, I'm from Mes- uh, Magnolia, Mississippi, man. There you go, baby. Uh, 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 Magnolia, Mississippi is at the very bottom of uh, Mississippi. Uh, eight miles from Cape Louisiana and 45 minutes from New Orleans, man. You got that whole mixture in here. Right, right. And how did Gold Toes get his name? I couldn't tell you. The Gold Toes? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> man, off the off the gold Dayton's on them cars, off the Lolo's, man. <laughs> in front of my house, I used to have all my cars that had Dayton rims on them, so they all go in. So, uh, cool nothing, bald hair Rick from out of San Francisco, California, named me Gold Toes. Get- oh, okay, yeah, I like that. I like the the the, the GT uh, the the necklace you got. That's I right. like the GT. I appreciate. I, I, pre- I appreciate the phone call, brother. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. So West Side Riders, man. Uh, it, it actually um, it did get promotions, but it didn't get the full throttle, and it didn't stay on the shelf due to uh, some complications they have between Papa right. Snoop and the other CEO. And it really, so it wasn't able to last out there forever to to keep replenishing and restocking right. uh, uh, the stores. Well, you didn't get the promotion. You know everybody didn't know. Is, no, is the it, promotion was deep. No, it, really? No, it came out with a bang. But the, I, I can't the, remember. The what, business, what year did it come out in? Give us a, give us a second this? color. Nine, nine, eight, 98, 98, yep. I think November 98. It was, it was like right 90. after 17 Reasons, 18 with a bull. So oh, 98. Right. 98. I, I was in jail right. 98. So maybe yep. that's what it is. Right, I right. mean, they had a calendar, you know, shout out uh, an RIP, rest in peace, Frank Carrera. He had a lot to do. To color, color, who's this? Uh, Sh- showcase Magazine. Yeah, Showcase. Color, color. Got to tell you something. What's going on, brother? Talk to us. What's up? Man, uh, Uncle, you know, Pop Snoop, how you, how you maintain so young, man? Uh, man. <laughs> I get my rest, man. I believe in God. Uh, that's right, brother. That's right. What, what's the? You, you eat free, or you you careful what you eat? What do I eat? Uh, I eat, I eat uh, a lot of vegan food. I eat a lot of veggies, uh, apples, oranges, peanuts, and all that kind of stuff, man. And a Corona with the lime. And Corona with the lime. <laughs> that's to right. Corona to cure the Corona. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. All right, brother. Thanks, all right, all thanks, right. Thanks, thanks Much love to the Rata. You got to take care, man. Thank you, brother. This is the Northeast. You. That's all right. right, thanks, man. All right, all right. yeah, you, you know, uh, we 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 met each other earlier, and anybody who who meets uh, Papa Snoop will realize where a lot of Snoop Dogg swag is from. Where a lot of Snoop, <laughs> no, straight up, it, it, it's not something that you can sit there and say, "Nah, that ain't Snoop Dogg's dad." You like, no, but the guy looks just like him. Like this is Snoop when he's seventy four years old. Yeah, if he's lucky, <laughs> if he's lucky enough to get that old and be that, hey, be like that. That's exactly how you are, and, and yeah. I love it, dude. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I, I love it. So, so, um, what's up, Toes, man? Man, I'm good, man. I'm just, I'm happy that uh, me and Papa Snoop, we've been chopping it up for like. I want to say three, four months. You know what I'm saying? We talk damn near once a day. You know what I mean? And uh, we got, you know, like I said, we met through a mutual friend of mine. And after that, it's like peanut butter and jelly, man. You know what I'm saying? We make things happen. And on the business aspect, you know, he was able to uh, 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 let me open up to him about the business aspect right. of things. And, 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 and that's how the, this is just one compilation that, uh, you know, he, he that we're bringing back to life. But there's other things. We got Wes in the building. And I'm bringing Wes, That's right? And and this is an artist that he has an interest in, and he was going to be managing, and um, you know, uh, bringing him to the forefront. And Wes is from where? Wes is actually from Texas, H Town, yeah. baby. Nah, he uh, oh, Texas Arcana. Uh, okay, okay. You know, okay. To, you know he, 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 he might be our next interview. Oh, he's tight too. Uh, he he got I'm some. I'm done with that. Matter of fact, I had him and Little Mondo uh, out of San Francisco together, man, and I, I see big things happening. You heard of him, yeah, today he, in the yeah, studio. great voice. You man. know what I'm saying? So we got two, uh, you know, young black and brown brothers that's going, you know, possibly. caller, caller, who's this? Collab. As if he's still there. Uh, yeah, first I want to say my name is Miguel, and it's an honor and a privilege. Miguel uh, does to it. talk to. Talk to us, Miguel. Hey. Hey, I want to say it's an honor and privilege to talk to you guys, man. Um, Thank you. Especially you, Gil. You, you've been doing a lot of hard work, man. Um, I have one question for Snoop's dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Papa Snoop. Yeah, yeah man. Not- hey, like I said, it's a, it's a privilege to actually get a chance to talk to you, man. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, 
Did you ever get a chance to like get any tattoos, or how do you feel about them? Now, man, man, I love tattoos, man. I'm just dark and and, and mine man won't show up. <laughs> uh, now, my, if I got one right now, you never see it. <laughs> that's a great answer. It's a true answer. All right, Miguel, you get your answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was asking because uh, was it called Mr. Cartoon Tattooed uh, Snoop Dogg? I think he tattooed Nate Dogg on him, right? I don't know. Yeah, Nate, don't yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. He tattooed Nate, uh, Nate Dogg on him. I think Warren G did too. That's right. Yeah, they was boys, yeah. man. They yeah, had a group called Two One Three back in the day. Yeah, for sure. We all remember mm-hmm. that. Hey, thanks for the phone call, Miguel. You gotta... All right, thank you, guys. Thank all you, right, brother. How's going? All right, we're gonna stop the phone calls right there with Miguel. Yeah, Miguel always calls and he has one sided here. I don't know if he's, I don't know who the feds, but I, uh, this is historic, brother. This is great. I, I mean, I, I was just so excited to talk about. At first, I was like, Snoop Dogg's that. He probably did you did you think I was bullshit? No, I, I said, no. Oh, this I okay. Let me keep it real. Every once in a while, I call, mm. I call him. I'm let, trying to put the plan yeah. Let together. me let me keep it real. I heard, hey, I got Snoop Dogg's that. I said, man, he probably got some guy that ain't seen Snoop in fucking thirty <laughs> years. He 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 so he so. I ain't, and no disrespect to you, pops. I'm like, he probably some deadbeat motherfucker that, that ain't seen Snoop Dogg in about thirty years. And his came to fame is yeah, I'm Snoop Dogg's daddy. His daddy, Snoop Dogg, that ain't my daddy. But then I did, I did my homework. I said, oh shit, hell yeah, I want to hear that story because you've been there. Mm-hmm. You you've been that father figure that so many people in the rap game are missing. You're right, right? I agree. Yeah, yeah. He's he's. Hey, I'm gonna tell you, he's 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 what he's an example of what it should be. Yes, humble, inviting, but he's strict. He ain't gonna just let you play him. But you see that when you speak. To well, him. he's 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 an old school brother. He's you know an old school brother that been there, done that. What was raised by his daddy correctly, and my mom, and your that was next one, and your mama correctly. Mm. Uh, how is your relationship now with uh, or is Snoop Dogg's mom still? She passed away. No, she passed away t- almost two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. How, how was your relationship before she passed? Were you guys? Like- no, 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 we have always been loved one another for life. Really? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a- my that's what she let everybody know that that was my first love, Vernia. That's beautiful, mm-hmm. and, and and that's very important. Mm-hmm. And, and before we go, I want to ask you that: How important is a family in, for raising kids, as far as both parents not have not necessarily being married, but being there for their kids? Well, here's the deal: Me and Bella have always always had the chemistry. You know what like I said? You no, know, it's always that, that one girl you're gonna love, right? Yes. And she was she was the one, and we had, we enjoyed our grandkids together. Okay, from kids. Okay, and. She, the thing that broke my heart she had a birthday party she turned 70 years old right and the next day she had a she had a, she had a heart attack the next day the next day man and uh me and stoop what me and stoop and, and his brothers would go out there on sundays because she was she was the minister right right and she was off in the church and we always go out to the, to the nursing home and have church with her but what broke my heart she was just laying there man and i cried inside and the day when Stu brought her to the compound to, to view for people to, to view about it Believe it or not, this is how much I, I, le- I, I was in love with her. Got you, I was feeling all right. When I seen nobody, stupid tell you, my brother will tell you. I threw up all day long. <laughs> Half the night, my grandson's dog pop. Grandpa, you must have been in love. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I, I, I got sick. I was sick all day and half the night. Okay? That was a piece of me. Cause she, it's like a piece of me went with her. Right. I never felt that bad in my life, man. I threw up all day and half the night. I couldn't it stop. You. It, it, hit it hit me it hard, hit man. I ain't going to lie to you. Yeah. It still hit me today because... When I walk in my house in Georgia, I got a picture right there when I walk up my stairs, right there in my fireplace. And I always tell her I love her. God that was my first love, man. God I mean, bless you. And yeah, her. we never was married, but like I said, that was the only woman I really, really loved, man. Just God that simple, man. Guys, man. Yeah. I think I think that's the perfect note to leave it at. Uh, mm. You can tell your 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 uh, your shout outs over there, pops. Let them know. Let, let the haters know where they can find you. Let them know what's going on over there, pops. To all the haters, pop is P O P Pop Stupid Entertainment. To all the people who love me, that know me, you know I keep it real. I want to shout out, send a shout out to all of the, uh, my coworkers at the post office in Detroit and L A. And I want to send out a shout, a shout out to Dr. Dre, Warren G, all the guys who got me to where I am. Uh, whether you know it or not, I was a fly, fly on the wall and just been around you guys. Yo, you guys taught me the, taught me the music business. I've been in the background for 30, 33 and a half years. But as you know, I'm not the type of guy that, that, that going to be out there saying I'm Stoop Dog's father trying to glorify myself. I can tell a lot of people, Stoop, that's what he do. That's right. Okay, I'm retired. I enjoy my grandkids. I'm just glad that he told he did what I told him to do, do better than me. Mm. Don't be like me, be better than me. He did that. I 
love it. And that's what every father should, should do for their kids. Yes, sir. Tell your kids to be better than you. Don't do what I do. Do what I say do. You'll be all right. That's right. That's what I told Stoop. And here we are. Man, with that, take us to black, man. I can't say it to beat Papa that. Thank Snoop, you, man. Yeah. Appreciate man, it. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, man. Yeah. That was-